Uh, we'll call the January 5th, 20, or 2021 Longmont City Council regular session to order. Can we start with the roll call, please? Mayor's here. Mayor's here. Council Member Christensen? Here. Council Member Hidalgo Faring? Here. Council Member Martin? Here. Council Member Peck? Here. Council Member Rodriguez? Here. Council Member Waters? Here. Mayor, you have a quorum. Great. All right, let's go ahead and say the pledge. Polly, do you want to start the pledge for us? Kick off the year with a good one. Sure. Um, I pledge allegiance, pledge allegiance to the flag, flag of the United, United States, States of America. Of America. America. For which it stands, one nation, one nation under God, God indivisible, with liberty, liberty and, justice and justice for all. For all. Thanks, Polly. All right, quick reminder to the public anyone wishing to provide public comment during the first call, public invited to be heard, must watch the live stream of the meeting in order to. Uh, in order to uh, gain access, uh, callers are not able to access the meeting at any other time. So we'll go ahead and throw this up when it's time and you can go ahead and call in and then you'll be notified by the last uh, three or four numbers of your phone number. So just pay attention on the live stream. All right, can I have a motion to approve the December 15th, 2020 regular session minutes, please? So move. So move. All right, it's been moved by Council Member Waters, seconded by Council Member Christensen. Any debate on this topic, guys? All right, all in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed, say nay. All right, let's go ahead and we're gonna actually, um, we're gonna go ahead and mix it up a little bit. First of all, any agenda revisions or submission of documents or motions to direct the city manager? Let's go with council member Hidalgo Ferry. This is the first one of the year. Don't blow it, Susie. Okay. Well, I actually, I, I, I have one question and one, um, something I want to bring to a future agenda. Um, I'd like to see an update on the work that um, Karen Rooney and um, Community Services has been doing in connection with um, Boulder County uh, around RV um, services or just any kind of RV lot. What have they discovered? Um, you know, I'd like to see some kind of, I, I, was, I guess I was hoping we'd have something before the ordinance came into effect and it's come into effect and I haven't seen any progress on what we can do to um, for the RVs that are parked in the streets that have no place to go. So, I, right, my understanding, did we table this? I thought we passed it and it goes into effect on the first. Yes. Right, so so we can, we can have, uh, you know, we can have staff bring something back that kind of mm -hmm. lets us know what's going on and what's the result and that kind of stuff, but it's been yeah. voted on, but it's, it's yeah. already in effect. Yeah, yeah. But, so I'd um, like to bring something, just an update, okay, uh, sooner can, rather than later, all right. so we can help these folks out. There's no I motion. I second but, that. Okay, I was gonna say, there's no motion, but I'll go ahead and put it on the agenda, but it's been seconded, so let's vote on it. Uh, it's been moved that we actually have our update on this. Um, Harold on the RV ordinance and how it's impacting the city specifically where the RV is going. So it was moved, moved by council member Dago Faring and seconded by council member Christensen. Any other debate on this? Anybody mind it coming back? Council member Peck. Thank you. Um, no, I'm going to vote for it because we do need an update, but I think part of what I'm understanding from uh, councilwoman Hidalgo Faring is, are you referring to safe lots, people who want housing here? Okay. Yeah. And yes, possibly, if not that, how do we house them? So yes. they don't so really looking at the solutions aspect of this, what we were trying to pass, you know, the ordinance with getting RVs off the street. Now let's start looking getting on getting an update on the solutions for these folks. Thank you. Yep. All right. So do you want to put the, why don't you go ahead and make a, make the motion again, Susie? So I move to direct staff to provide us an update on safe lots and um, I, I just um, were just an update on how the RV solution is progressing. <laughs> Second. All right. So the, the the motion is to have an update on by by city staff on the safe lots program uh -huh. and how the RV ordinance is progressing. Not um, necessarily the ordinance, but where do these where can where do these folks go? Okay, I'm, I'm, what I, I, I'm just have? So right, that, right. I'm not. I'm I just guess, trying to. I'm just trying to restate the motion. No, I'm not no, making no, a motion. I'm just trying. Kind of vague. I'm, 
That's all right. So we just need to direct staff okay. on what. Harold, you got it. Got it. All right. Okay. Does everybody want to vote on this, or Harold says he's got it? And as the mayor, I, it's going on the agenda. Anybody else? Do we, do we mind just a consensus? Harold says he's got it. I'll bring it back. I feel consensus. Okay, good. We're going to go ahead and just Harold. Can you? It'll be on please? Tuesday. We'll add it real quick because we have that. Perfect. Good job, okay. Susie. What else, Susie? I'm oh, sorry, Councilmember Dago Fang. What else? You know, I just had a quick earlier. I had made the motion to. I wanted an update on what what was happening on North Main Street, um, as far as um, in. Um, the progress with the comp plan and everything that they had planned for the North uh, Main Street corridor. I just wanted to know when was that planning to come back to us for an update? When is it, when Harold? Of Mayor Bagley, members of council, Joni Marsh, assistant city manager. So we did have an information item about the North Main Street plan in your packet about a month ago um, mm -hmm. to give you all an update as to where some of those items were. And we were hoping that if you saw some specific items, you would we could have a conversation with you and then bring that back. We currently don't have anything scheduled, but we'll be happy to take a look at that. Yeah, I just wanted to see what was scheduled as far as right. nothing so, at this time, but I can I can work can we, on that. Can we? And so, can you go ahead and put that on a future agenda here within the next? You know, can you bring it back within the next forty-five days, Harold? Yeah, and I think what would be good is on the information item if folks can look at that, and that way we can see what is a particular interest, so we can focus on that too. Okay, that would be right. great. Thanks. Right. So I think that was a polite way of saying we have a lot of the information. So read what we got and then come back with questions. Okay. Mm -hmm. Anything else, Councilmember Dago Faring? That is it. Thank you. All right, Councilmember Martin. Thank you, Mayor Bagley. Um, the Colorado Mountain Pack is a 501c3 nonprofit that focuses on sustainability um, uh, regarding the Rocky Mountain area. And they have prepared a letter, which I sent to everybody or had Don send to everybody this afternoon. And um, it's a letter to the Biden transition team asking that he uh, emphasize a lot of things that are in our policy, such as the protection of public lands, the control of uh, emissions from the extraction industry. I'm seeing nods. It sounds like everybody's seen it. So I would like to move that Longmont um, sign this letter as a city to uh, the Biden transition team. All right. The, the, only, the only thing is we can put it on a future agenda, but we don't, we only, this is a time only to direct staff to do things. So we can have it come back, but we can't take action on anything right now. So we can, Harold, when, when is this letter? Do you know, Marsha, when the- Yeah, they want, it, they want it by the 13th. So I did not realize that I could not just put a motion, make a motion can we, here. Can we put it on for next next uh, meeting, Harold? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that means the packet will go out. I mean, the packet's gonna go a little late, but that's fine. Yeah, yeah. Is that okay, Marsha? We can vote on yeah. Tuesday and sign it? Yes. Okay, we'll get that done. Okay. Council Member Peck, I'm sorry. You go ahead, yeah, Councilmember Peck. Okay, thank you, uh, Mayor Bagley. Um, I would like to make a motion to have um, an update on the Early Childhood Education Coalition. I've been attending some of those meetings and they're doing an incredible job. Uh, and I'm very, very impressed with it. Uh, Council, Councilman Waters also has been at those meetings. But what I'm finding is that there, uh, after COVID, there seems to be a move forward on what they, where they wanna go and their vision, et cetera. And since this is part of our work plan, I think that council should have an update on it. Um, it looks like though from, from, the, uh, from what I've read that it's gonna take maybe a couple of months or more for them to get the information together from a survey they're putting out as well as some of the documentation. So I would like to uh, make a motion that um, when the Early Childhood Education Coalition has finished with the survey and completed their uh, agenda on where they wanna go that we have a, a presentation and an update. Make sure that it goes with our work plan. Second. All right, uh, Council Member Waters. Um, thanks Mayor Bagley. For whatever it's worth, and do, hold on a second. Um, I want to recognize there was a motion to place uh, early childhood education progress. Uh, Councilmember Peck has made that motion to have that 
uh, brought back in the form of a status report. It was seconded by Council Member Christensen. Okay, sorry, Dr. Waters. So specifically relationship to the motion. Um, <clears throat> parallel to the, what's going on with the coalition, uh, uh, LEDP has as one of their priority areas, uh, talent recruitment uh, with uh, childcare as being one of the areas uh, in which to develop a plan to help with talent recruitment. And um, uh, so I, in response to the LEDP and I, in trying to move the dial for uh, the Early Childhood Coalition, um, I've, I've put together a draft plan. I've had some input from members of the coalition. It's gonna be presented to the coalition next Monday um, and it isn't all that the coalition's doing, but if the coalition gives it a thumbs up, um, it would be a, a set of a couple of goals with a set of objectives um, with some empty cells that have to be filled in with strategies and activities. But it would, but what at least would be a mark for um, what the what the work might look like in 2021. And if that would be helpful, I'd be delighted to share that as part of that update. If anybody is interested in it. That would be great, um, and and I was curious as the as to the role of LEDP. So uh, thank you very much. I, I do think council needs to hear that. I, I'll talk more about. Can I weigh back in, Mayor Bagley? Uh, I'll talk more about this when we get into the into the both on Monday and when we get into this with the council. Um, the intent with the formatting would be not only to serve at the coalition and LEDP. Uh, but, the, but to create a platform from which or off of which we could develop proposals for external funding. Uh, there's a fair amount of foundation money uh, that's being made available to support child care and early childhood initiatives. Some of it through the Sorensen Center uh, Impact Center at the University of Utah. Um, and I, there is a keen interest, I know, in the part of, of several who are involved with the coalition. If we could firm this plan up, put it so it, it synchron it's, it's synchronous with the uh, Boulder County, the Early Childhood Council of Boulder County, and advances LEDP's interest uh, to kind of get behind going after some external funding to support what we are doing as a council and what, what how others are investing in child care in, in Longmont and in Boulder County. Councilmember Christensen. Actually, Aaron was first. I didn't see Aaron. Aaron, you, all right, Mayor Pro Tem. Uh, thank you, Mayor Bagley, and thank you, Council Member Christensen, for acknowledging that. Uh, because it actually is not necessarily a point of order, but to go back slightly to Council Member Martin's motion, I believe, which I don't think got seconded, I would have seconded it. Uh, Mayor, are you actually just going to put this on the agenda without a vote? Uh, just for a clarification, because I did not catch that. And if so, that's fine. But I'd ha be happy to have it to second it as well as have a vote on Councilmember Martin's. And what was the what was the what Councilmember Martin for the the council to sign on to this letter that has a number of issues, which a good portion of them I think are directly related to Longmont, some not so much necessarily. Mm -hmm. Right. And so, what are you saying, Councilmember Rodriguez? that nobody seconded a motion and I was just asking for clarification if you're putting this on the future yeah. agenda to have a it's sign coming, on to it. It's coming on Tuesday. Via the mayor's prerogative. That's my question. Well, yeah, it's, it's coming on Tuesday. Because we didn't vote on anything and nobody no, seconded yeah, we, No, no, the motion was to actually take the vote. The, the motion was out of order because we can't vote on something only to direct staff. That's the point of the, this. Absolutely. Particular. We right. just didn't have a second or a vote on that. So. Right. And then, and, then I, and, then I, and then I just told Harold, let's put it on the agenda when. And he says he'll bring okay. it back on Tuesday. I so just wanted to clarify that we, that was we specifically are, the mayor's prerogative issue. Yeah. It, is, it will be on the agenda on Tuesday unless Harold screws up. <laughs> or somebody. Or the, the, yeah, it's going on on Tuesday. You know, I, I, I literally, I, I personally, I mean, anybody want to give me a call and put something on the agenda? Let's just do it. I don't, I, it's, it's not that big of a deal. I just, no worries. I was just trying to clarify what just happened there. Yep. That's it. Nope. Tuesday, we're going to vote on it. Okay. All right. Who else wants to say something? Council Member Christensen. Um, NLC, the National League of Cities, also has a, uh, a lot of uh, early childhood initiatives, and they have funding available too. So we should definitely... 
uh, look into getting funding from the National League of Cities for uh, early childhood education and uh, all kinds of education. <laughs> Thanks. All right. The uh, anything else? Okay, so Harold, you've made a list on all those things to get put on agendas. Um, can we just have a vote on my motion? What was it? What was your motion? I forget. <laughs> It was to put uh, the Early Childhood Education Coalition presentation on a future agenda once they have their... Uh... Oh, yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah. Uh, uh, all in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed, say nay. All right. Motion carries unanimously. It's going on a future agenda. All right. Thanks, Joe. Oh, sorry. Councilmember Peck. Thank you. All right. Um... <laughs> I just like you guys, first name basis, I'm sorry. All right, the, uh, let's go on now to, let's take it a little bit out of order and do uh, a proclamation recognizing January 5th, 2021 as Nino Gallo Day or Nino Gallo Day in Longmont, Colorado. Um, is it Nino or is Nino, right? Nino. Don, you were supposed to give me a heads up if that was correct. Gallo. <laughs> is it Nino, Nino or Ni Nino? Okay, Nino. Nino. Right, Nino so Gallo. N Nino Gallo is how we're pronouncing that. Is that? All right, just making sure. All right, so I'm going to read this both in Spanish and in English at the request of uh, people asking that I that I that I issue the proclamation. So let's go ahead and do. Uh, we're going to do English first, and then we'll do Spanish. Or did I did I say it the other way around? Mayor, I think we have the Spanish ready for, oh, All Susan right. switched, whichever okay. you like to do. All right, let's, let's do English first so we know what I'm reading. All right, so it says, Proclamation recognizing January 5th, 2021 as Nino Gallo Day in Longmont, Colorado. Whereas Nino Gallo served Longmont and the Boulder County community for 25 years and will be remembered for making those who crossed his path feel welcomed, included, and cared for, and for his work with community programs, agencies, and local governments serving people with low incomes, immigrants, and vulnerable at-risk community members. And whereas Nino began his work supporting immigrant farm workers and families at a housing, as a housing manager for Casa Vista and Casa de la Esperanza, both located in Longmont and continued his immigrant work with the community action programs in 2000 by creating the Immigrant Advocacy Latino Parent Leadership and You Know Your Rights campaign. And whereas Nino created the Personal Individual Enterprise Program after attending a National Individual Development Account Conference and partnering with the then named Foothills United Way to support education, small business and home ownership goals with match savings accounts to which the city has annually contributed funding to benefit Longmont residents. And whereas Nino was a founding partner of the Immigrant Integration Program that provided coordination of immigrant services and advocacy with El Comité de Longmont and other partner agencies. And whereas Nino was involved in multiple community initiatives, including the Longmont Housing Opportunities Team, Latino Task Force, and Latino Chamber. And whereas Nino was a member of the Longmont delegation that brought home Longmont's first All-America City Award in 2006. And whereas Nino mentored generations that would follow him by modeling good character, compassion, and optimism, and leading with authenticity, kindness, and a love for humanity. Now, therefore, I, Brian J. Bagley, Mayor, by virtue of the authority vested in me in the City Council of the City of Longmont, do hereby recognize today, January 5th, 2021, which is Nino's birthday, as Nino Gallo Day in Longmont. Encourage friends and residents of Longmont to engage, engage in appropriate celebrations and reflections of Nino's life and legacy. So, and then La Proclamación que reconoce el 5 de enero de 2021 como día de Nino Gallo in Longmont, Colorado. Considerando que Nino Gallo sirvió a Longmont ya a la, ya a la comunidad lo condado de Boulder por 25 años, será recordado por hacer sentir aquellos que se cruzaron su camino bienvenidos, incluidos y atendidos con cariño y será recordado por su trabajo con agencias y gobiernos locales en programas comunitarios para ayudar a personas de bajos ingresos, inmigrantes y miembros vulnerables de la comunidad. Y considerando que Nino comenzó su trabajo ayudando a los trabajadores agrícolas inmigrantes y a sus familias bajo su, su rol como administrador de viviendas en Casa Vista y Casa de la Esperanza, ambas ubicadas en Longo y en el 20,000 continuó su trabajo con los programas de acción comunitaria, creando programas como Immigrant, immigrant Advocacy, Latino Parent Leadership y Campaña Conozca, or 
Latino Parent Leadership y Campaña Conozca Sus Derechos, y considerando, considerando que Nino creó el programa personal individual Enterprise después de asistir a una conferencia nacional y asociarse con la, con la entonces llamada Foothills United Way para así apoyar la educación y las metas de pequeños negocios y propietarios de viviendas con cuentas de oro a las que la ciudad ha contribuido con fondos anualmente para beneficiar, beneficiar a los residentes de Longmont. Y, consider, y considerando que Nino fue socio fundador del programa de integración para inmigrantes que proporcionó coordinación de servicios y defensa para inmigrantes juntos con el Comité de Longmont y otras agencias asociadas, y considerando que Nino participó en múltiples iniciativas comunitarias, incluido el equipo de oportunidades de vivienda de Longmont, el grupo de trabajo latino y la Cámara de Comercio Latina, y considerando que Nino fue miembro de la delegación de Longmont que se llevó a casa el primer premio All-American City de Longmont en 2006, y considerando que Nino fue mentor de generaciones que lo, segura, que lo se, seguirán, Nino fue mentor de generaciones que lo seguirán modelando por su buen cara, cara, carácter, compasión y optimismo, y li, uh, liderando con autenticidad. My, my eyes are going. He lider, uh, he liderando con autenticidad, autent, um, am amabilidad y amor por la humanidad. Por lo tanto, yo, Brian J. Bagley, alcalde, en virtud de la autoridad que se me confiere y al con, uh, Consejo Municipal de la Ciudad de Lomo por la presente, reconozco el 5 de enero de 2021, hoy, a cumpleaños de Nino, como el día de Nino Galo en Lomo y aliento a amigos y residentes de Lomo a participar en celebraciones y reflexiones apropiadas de la vida y del lego de Nino y del legado del niño. Signed, the mayor. Let me get back here. All right, that was probably the most difficult proclamation I've ever read, but uh, thank you, Nino Galo. And uh, Norma, muchas gracias por compartir tu esposo con nosotros. Mucho cariño hacia ti y tu familia. Mayor, I think the family has, uh, would like to say a few words. Uh, absolutely. Mitsue, si. Mitsuo, perdón. Y todos los miembros de la familia, si gustan prender su, sus cámaras. Hola. Buenas tardes. Buenas tardes. Bienvenidos a, a todos. Gracias. Gracias, alcalde Begley. Muchas gracias. Eh, bueno, para nuestra familia, en motivo del más profundo orgullo, conocer del reconocimiento póstumo a quien en vida entregó su energía, su talento, su compromiso y su empatía a quienes necesitando un servicio profesional, se encontraban con quien entregaba más allá de sí a quienes más lo, lo precisaban. Imaginamos por cada muestra de cariño recibida que el sello de Nino Galo en su ámbito laboral era de singular éxito. No podemos concebir otra opinión, otra percepción. Sin duda alguna que su aporte será recordado con el valor y aprecio de quien entregó por tantos años su vocación de servidor público. Él era y estaba siempre para los demás. Por cierto, nada de esto podría ser sin que tuviera esa fina sintonía con la que representaba además Nino como persona. Y acá nos encontramos con un muy buen hombre, un padre ejemplar y un abuelo que no paraba de llenarse de vida. Tan buen hombre era que fue forjado en una tierra que le abrió puertas, no exento de enormes sacrificios y silenciosos dolores y que con más de algún temor y duda logró consolidar su futuro. Abrazó a su Nina y Claudia y avanzó sin parar, sin detenerse, y sin llorar. Su vida laboral y familiar 
estaba equilibrada por ese buen hombre que nos deja la enseñanza y ejemplo de ser feliz, ser afable, ser padre, todo es posible. Gracias por darnos este espacio y desde acá acompañar en silencio este dolor que nos abraza. Nos puede calmar en parte el dolor de esta tremenda partida, solamente la convicción de que el reconocimiento de su gente allá tan lejos nos permita nunca más olvidarlo. Muchas gracias. No, thank, thank you, you guys, for, for having such a wonderful father, a member of your family, and for all the many things that he did for our community. Uh, one, of the, one of the best proclamations I've done. So thank you. We, we're very grateful. Thank you. So anything else, Norma? Do you want to say anything? I just want to say thank you. We really appreciate it, appreciate it everything you have done for Nino. And we're looking forward to celebrate his legacy and today and every single day. Thank you on behalf of all the entire family, leaders, and community members. Thank you thank, so much. Thank you very much. Mucho cariño hacia ustedes. Gracias. Igualmente. Gracias a todos. Okay. All right. Let's move on now to uh, the COVID city manager's report, specifically the update on COVID-19. And it might be a little lengthy tonight, so we'll be patient. Yeah, Mayor. Um, so we've, we've had a couple of weeks. Um, still a lot of work going on um, in terms of issues. Uh, related to COVID-19. So we're gonna have a couple of presentations. The first is gonna be um, with Jessica Erickson and LADP in terms of the five-star program that we've been working on um, preparing and to work on with the county. Jessica, are you there? I am. All right. Susan, do you have a presentation? If you wanna pull that up, that'd be great. One moment, I got lost in all my screens. <laughs> all right, there you are. Okay, thank you. And good evening, Mayor Bagley and council members. Thank you for your time this evening. I wanted to provide an update on progress towards a Boulder County application uh, for a five-star certification program. I'll talk a little bit about um, what that is, understanding there might be varying levels of familiarity with what a five-star certification program is. And then we'll talk about where we're at in the process with Boulder County. Um, and I'm happy to answer any questions as I go along or at the end of the presentation. Um, Susan, if you want to uh, go to the next slide. Just briefly talk about what is five-star certification. Um, so back in mid-December, I believe it was December 14th or 18th, but right before the Christmas holiday, uh, the governor's office and CDPHE announced they were going to provide an opportunity for counties to set up programs through an administrative committee responsible for developing, implementing, and overseeing five-star certification programs, which would offer businesses within those counties that have programs the ability to operate at um, restrictions at a lower level on the dial. So if the county is in orange, those businesses that re receive certification would be able to operate basically under an individual business variance, allowing them to operate at level yellow. Um, part of the purpose of the program, other than um, the benefits provided to businesses, is to encourage businesses to implement safety measures that are beyond what is required by public health orders um, in order to help slow the spread of COVID-19. The program is voluntary. Businesses are not required to participate. Counties are not required to apply for or stand up five-star certification program. I will note, however, that uh, every uh, Metro Denver County with the exception of Boulder County has now submitted an application uh, for a program and many have been approved. The program per CDPHE guidelines cannot be led by public health However, public health does have to participate on the administrative committee. I know the slide says should, um, but it is requirement of the program that a public health official participate on the administrative committee for the program. Next slide. Um, so just going to, into a little bit more detail about the benefits to businesses um, and eligibility. 
counties currently in level blue, yellow, or orange are eligible to pursue five-star certification program um, if the following metrics are met and the thresholds of their respective levels for seven days, including incidence rate, percent positivity, and hospitalizations. Any county that's currently in red has to meet the additional criteria of a, a two-week sustained decline in incidence, a percent positivity rate under 10% or demonstrably improving over the past two weeks, and under 90% of ICU beds. If we were to ever go into level purple, which is the relatively new level that would include um, kind of a complete shutdown again of businesses, there would be no more five-star certification programs. There would be no more variants for certified businesses. Next slide. If a county does see um, after implementing their five-star certification program, if a county sees a significant rise in cases or hospitalizations, the program may be suspended either by the administrative committee or by CDPHE. Suspension of a, of a five-star program automatically occurs if the region, the county reaches more than 90% of their counties or the RETAC ICU hospital capacity. So that would result in automatic suspension of the program. Next slide. So the steps for us to pursue as a county or for Boulder County to pursue a five-star certification program are to form an administrative committee. I'll go into more details about that in a, a later slide. Determine the financial resources to implement the program that do not come from public health. CDPHE has been very clear that resources should not be taken away from the important work of public health in uh, distributing vaccines and the other work that they're doing relative to COVID-19 in order to stand up these programs. We must develop a plan for compliance and enforcement that includes a live inspection. Uh, we can use a third party vendor, which will be important later in the presentation. We have to develop a plan for applications, training, inspections, tracking, tailored for our county and submit a variance application to CDPHE with supportive letters from commissioners, uh, law enforcement, and all of the hospitals within the county. Our proposal to Boulder County and our hopeful application at, by the end of this week will be a proposal and an application that includes contracting with a third party vendor, H2 Manufacturing Solutions, a local manufacturing consulting firm, for the administration of a program and the train the trainer inspector program. Again, I'll go into more detail on a later slide. Next slide. So as we mentioned, the first step is to form an administrative committee. Uh, so the administrative committee, and this has come out of kind of a, a subgroup that has been working on this from across the county um, over several weeks. The proposed administrative committee that will include in our application to CDPHE would include Corinne Waldo and myself as co-chairs. It's prim primarily because we've been leading the charge to get to the application and doing a lot of work, the work that's been required to, uh, to create the program and uh, develop the program application and all of the elements of that. We'll also include a Boulder County Public Health Rep who we believe will be Lane Drager, a Boulder County Commissioner's Rep, Slide says summer laws. We found out today it will actually be Michelle Krizak, a representative from the Latino Chamber of Commerce to support our ability to create equitable opportunities across our entire community to access the five-star program should we get it up and running. A representative from our third-party vendor, H2 Manufacturing Solutions, likely their founder, Heidi Hostetter. And then we have a number of open seats. We'll have five additional municipal representatives two representatives from industry or the community at large, one representative from one of the hospitals in the county and a law enforcement representative. We're currently taking applications for those open seats on the administrative committee. The administrative committee will be formed and will meet for the first time on Thursday afternoon and with the intention to meet weekly for the first three weeks after hopeful application approval and then every other week once the program's up and running. Next slide. So this chart provides just a little bit more detail on the potential benefits for businesses that go through a certification program uh, in Boulder County or anywhere that has a five-star certification program. So if we use the example of a county that's currently at level orange, certified businesses would be able to operate at a yellow capacity. So they would go from 25% occupancy 
allowed to 50% occupancy allowed. Um, that would be for restaurants, for personal services would be the same 25 to 50% occupancy as well as indoor event venues. You'll see the note at the bottom that says that businesses can only operate at a higher level if the county's metrics fall within the level for two weeks. For example, even though the government moved, governor moved counties to orange, the certified businesses cannot operate at yellow until the county's metrics are at the orange level for two weeks. Uh, so as of today, if we had a program stood up, we wouldn't, certified businesses would not yet be able to operate in yellow until we meet those orange metrics for two weeks as a county. Next slide. All right, so we'll talk about our proposed uh, solution to standing up a Boulder County Five Star program, which uh, includes contracting much of the work out to a third party vendor, H2 Manufacturing Solutions. Again, they are a long lot based manufacturing consulting firm uh, with expertise in operational improvement consulting services, as well as engineering and technical consulting expertise. So why are we considering using them uh, as a third party vendor for our five-star program? H2 led the charge to form a Colorado Manufacturers COVID Task Force that was established way back in March, so at the very beginning of the pandemic, initially to help identify and fill holes in PPE and testing supply chains for manufacturers across the state, and ultimately evolved or pivoted, as we hear um, a lot lately, to helping businesses secure resources to comply with federal, state, and local public health guidelines. As a result, they created a product that they call Safety Systems and Certification, and they've been implementing that across the state. Again, I'll provide some more detail in a later slide. Um, and actually, let's go to the next slide. I think that detail is there. Um, if not, I'll have some more detail on their experience to date in uh, safety certification with the product that we'll be using that they'll provide. So the solution with H2 is that the administrative committee would outsource administration of the certification program to H2, uh, including development of business applications, recruiting and training auditors and inspectors, overseeing shadowing, administrating quality assurance and control um, for trained auditors, deploying the inspectors, issuing certifications, reporting to the administrative committee and to CDPHE and monitoring and following up on complaints. The anticipated cost for municipalities and the county is that the administration would be covered by an application fee, a nominal, what we consider a nominal application fee by businesses, and that the inspectors and would be volunteers donated by municipalities and businesses. Uh, so two sources for those uh, uh, inspectors, volunteer inspectors that would be trained, one would be underutilized employees or employees that are currently on uh, paid leave, either in the public or private sectors that could be repurposed uh, as inspectors, volunteer inspectors and auditors for the safety certification program. Next slide. So here's where we have some more detail about H2's experience and their COVID safety system and certification train the trainer model. So we will be identifying 40 to 75 volunteers, as I mentioned, and or repurposed paid employees from the public and private sector that H2 will train, deploy, and oversee as trained safety certification auditors as part of our step five star program. They'll provide 90 minutes of classroom, virtual classroom. We're not going to have a bunch of people in a room. Um, virtual classroom instruction followed by virtual shadowing of inspectors when they go out into the field. They'll be responsible for scheduling and deploying trained auditors at business facilities across Boulder County. Uh, they'll also monitor and oversee a command central, which is managed by H2 staff. They'll also compile test and process findings and data to ensure acceptable input data and variances. Uh, so what we mean when we talk about variance is, is across multiple inspectors in a similar environment, what's the variance uh, in the overall rating of a business? And H2 currently operates their safety system and certification model at less than a half a percent variance in ratings across, again, multiple auditors in the same environment. They also produce a scorecard and an action plan for a business to correct any infractions and then redeploy the auditor to facilitate to the facility to ensure infractions have been corrected. They then certify the business and issue a certificate that can be displayed at a facility for eight weeks. 
have another slide that has a chart that compares uh, different programs, including the original Mesa County model, PDPHE requirements, and the H2 program. And one of the primary differences and, and, and one of the things that we like about the H2 solution is that it's not in any way a self-certification program. So H2 is actually going out to or sending their trained auditors out to a business, providing that business with an action plan to get them from where they're at today to where they need to be to receive certification. The business is then responsible for implementing that action plan and then H2 and their volunteer auditors will go back out, ensure that that has happened before a certification is uh, supplied to the business. Okay, here's where I was talking about, apologies, this was a, a presentation put together by committees. So um, uh, I'm a little uh, unfamiliar with some of the order of it, but the H2 inspection um, system is again, a product that was developed by H2 as part of the COVID manufacturing task force. It has been tested in the field for over six months in a variety of facility types, including schools, manufacturing facilities, small businesses, et cetera, throughout Colorado. The inspection criteria was developed by public health and is built upon federal CDC, state and local public health regulations and additional Colorado five-star requirements. It incorporates 75 inspection criteria in the following categories, disinfecting and cleaning, signage, furniture, structure and objects, occupant behavior, and screening. A business must get a five out of five rating on the inspection for certification and follow through with the action plan for correcting any infractions and reinspection before any certification is issued. So far more rigor than what is required by uh, CDPHE in sending up a five-star program. Next slide. An additional element of the H2 safety certification program would be to recertify each facility every eight weeks to ensure continued safety compliance with a new cer certificate, dated certificate issued each time. So it's not a one and done, and then you can go, um, you know, uh, change all of your habits and behaviors back to uh, prior to certification. There's ongoing monitoring incorporated into the program. H2 will provide weekly reporting to the administrative committee containing the scorecards of each business, the action plans for each business the originally issued certificate and any subsequently issued certificates. So those every eight week certificates. They'll additionally pr provide support and are currently providing support on the development of the Boulder County application to CDPHE, supporting the development of business application for certification and supporting development of application to solicit volunteers and displaced workers uh, to serve as auditors. I'll also mention that uh, Denver County recently submitted their application and also announced that they've selected to use H2 as their vendor for third-party vendor for their certification program as well. Next slide. That's just an image of um, the scorecard and action plan, um, a page of the action plan that will be provided to businesses as part of the program. Next slide. So why do we think H2 provides the right solution for a Boulder County five-star program? Um, want to reiterate that they have six months of testing for their COVID safety system and certification program across Colorado. They've conducted over 30 safety systems uh, audits since June of this year, not 2019, sorry about that. Um, the safety systems have been conducted in seven different counties in both rural and urban environments and across multiple sectors, schools, large and small manufacturers, small businesses, places of worship, and a variety of others. The system was developed with the help of public health and specifically Boulder County Public Health. Lane was on that COVID manufacturing task force, as was I, um, and they have endorsed the system and model, including having helped determine the appropriate weighting of any infractions within the model. There is minimal out-of-pocket expense for businesses, the cost of implementation and administration of the program would self-fund by charging businesses a $75 to $100 application fee for businesses. We'll also have uh, programs in place to mitigate those expenses for businesses that truly can't afford a $75 to $100 application fee. We'll also have uh, programs in place to help mitigate the costs of addressing any infractions that are identified 
in order for businesses to get certification. Um, so where businesses have the ability to support the funding of the program through an application fee, um, they will, we will expect them to do so, but we have, we'll have systems in place to allow for businesses that don't have that ability to still be able to receive their certification. We really see this as an off the shelf proven and affordable model that is rooted in public health and data science uh, at a level of rigor that we don't see in other five-star programs that have been stood up thus far. Next slide. So we specifically compared uh, the original Mesa County five-star system that the CDPHE program was based on, as well as the CDPHE five-star program requirements and the H2 solution. And generally speaking, the number of the elements of inspection for the certification, as well as the rigor uh, with which they uh, provide ongoing support for ensuring ongoing um, information to businesses about uh, different CDPHE, CDC, and Boulder County Public Health guidelines. We've also been very impressed by, again, that variance number of less than half percent across multiple auditors in the same environment. Also, the reissuing of new certificates every eight weeks and um, the weekly reporting that's very rooted in data and, again, public health uh, rigor uh, that goes above and beyond certainly the Mesa County Five Star System, but also above and beyond what is actually required by CDPHE from a public health perspective. Next slide. So the next steps for us, as I mentioned, forming that administrative committee will fill those open positions over the next uh, couple of days between now and Thursday afternoon when we'll first convene that committee. Um, and then that committee will review the variance application that we've developed again in partnership with H2 in working with the county and working with county public health as well as um, chambers, other economic development organizations and municipalities across the country. Once that uh, application is signed off on by the administrative committee, uh, we will submit that application to CDPHE, but only with support from municipalities, chambers, and EDOs to the county commissioners. Um, so letters of support are being submitted to the uh, county commissioners. We also are required to have letters of support from all five of the hospitals in the county, as well as the, the Boulder County Sheriff. Well, almost simultaneously, um, but certainly immediately um, upon submitting that application, we'll start recruitment of volunteers to be inspectors and to staff the command um, central uh, working with H2. We don't know for sure how long application approval would take, but what we've seen so far is that CDPHE is turning around approval of those applications within a couple of days in most cases. And then providing general support for businesses to apply for five-star certification and show public health and safety protocols are in place. So it'll be part of our role to communicate to our business community that this program is available, uh, why they should pursue it, and how they can pursue it, as well as resources that are available, um, financial resources that are available to support their ability to do so. Next slide. And so that's where we're at as far as the um, Boulder County application for five-star certification program. With that, I'm happy to answer any questions. I've got some concerns, but let's go ahead and go with Councilmember Christensen. Okay. Uh, hi, um, Jessica, I think this is terrific. We've got to do everything we can to get businesses back in, back in the running. But um, so here's a very tiny point. Um, but on, I think, number four of what Mesa County provides, they provide certification and a plaque and a Wingo cling, meaning somebody can stick on the window that says we're certified. And none of, neither of the other two programs say they provide that. But to me, one of the most useful things for the public is to say, to be able to see right on somebody's front door that they've gone through certification. So I think that's something, you know, at, at a, it's a very minimal cost we could provide so that, you know, they can just slap this on the window and uh, then people can be walking down the street and see that they are certified and um, be assured that they can go in there. So just consider it, please. Thank you, um, Mayor Bagley and Councilwoman Christensen. That is actually 
part of a certification, a posted certification at the business facility is part of the uh, Boulder County, Five, or will be part of the Boulder County Five Star Program. Uh, one of the things that we were trying to show with that, with that chart is that that was kind of the primary thing for the Mesa County program. So it was more of a PR program than it was a program that also had um, or was intended to have the additional benefit of um, creating improved public health environment related to COVID-19. Uh, there will be a certification. There will also be a required posting of how somebody uh, entering that business can file a complaint with CDPHE if they notice something that's happening within the business that doesn't meet certification guidelines. Well, yeah, my point is though that just being able to give, give them in return for all their hard work, something they can put on their window that's decorative and not punitive <laughs> would be just nice for their, uh, you know, a nice return of yes, PR, but that's what they need is free PR, so. Yep, that will be a part of that. Thanks, Jessica. I know you put a lot. We spoke uh, on the phone a couple days ago, and I, sorry, uh, I'll always defer to council before I have my say. Go ahead, Councilmember Waters. Uh, two quick questions, Jessica. Um, in the in the presentation, you made a reference to kind of there's a bunch of thresholds in here in terms of what we can do and can't do. By the way, I want to say, I'll echo Councilmember Christensen's comments. Mm -hmm. I think you've done a lot of, there's a lot of work and it's, and it's good work. And and I'm, I'm very supportive of what, of moving this forward. Um, but the two questions are these. One, you made reference to the 90% of ICU beds being, you know, that's a threshold. If 90, if you hit the 90% level, then, then you've got to take a step backwards. But it did, it did spark for me uh, some curiosity about how we're doing that calculus. Is that beds within a county or is it beds counted the way, well, county commissioners counted them, but beds throughout multiple counties? It's best within, within the county as, as we count them. All right, very good, within this county. And then right. more generally, um, my guess is, uh, but this is an assumption, that there's been some discussion, given the minds that have come together with this and the experience and, the, and how deeply you've all been involved in this for now almost 10 months, um, there, there's got to be some speculation about the duration, how long do we anticipate needing uh, to take these kinds of uh, work through these kinds of protocols with this kind of rigor? Um, is this something you're imagining throughout all of 2021, just as a mindset, or is there something short of that or longer than a year? I'll listen. Um, based on what I'm seeing, I guess, and you look at where we are with the vaccines and we'll touch on some of that, probably my gut tells me late summer, fall, um, in terms of how long we're going to, to, to still be, to be in this mode based on where we're seeing the vaccines. Could be shorter if we get more out, could be longer if there's less coming in. Um, and, and so our mind, we're sort of, I'm starting to look at that August, September-ish horizon. So I said I'd be quiet. I'm gonna make a comment. That sounds kind of like we're imagining this as a, like uh, 40 weeks. Think of this as giving birth to, a, to, the, to the, whatever comes after, <laughs> after COVID. That's about the time frame. You're thinking about, about nine months of eight week cycles, likely. Potentially, yeah. yeah. It could be shorter. It could definitely be shorter based on how many people get vaccinated in that world. Yeah. Um, and I'll also add, we've absolutely had the conversation around, is it worth the resource for a potentially short period of time? Um, if everybody gets vaccinated or if things just start to go uh, re really in the right direction really quickly as far as the different metrics um, for the different uh, levels on the dial and we get all the way to green or whatever the best level is. Uh, but one of the conversations that we've had is that if we're going to build this infrastructure and invest in uh, something like this, both from a human and financial resource perspective, let's put our minds together and figure out how else it might be put to use uh, in the future. Uh, certainly in the situation of, God forbid, a future pandemic, we would have this infrastructure available and ready to stand up such that it would have more of a public health benefit from earlier on. Uh, than what we hope that it will have now. 
Um, but then also, are there other, and I don't know what they are, we haven't gotten that far into that conversation, but are there other um, implications for building infrastructure like this? All right, so, so first of all, Jessica, yeah, yeah um, I guess third of all, considering that Councilmember Christensen and Councilmember Waters had, had, had intelligent comments to say, thanks. Um, and I, I spoke with you and in general, I'm in favor of a five-star program. Mm -hmm. um, and not that anyone cares about my opinion, but I'm gonna say it anyway. The, uh, I was against the lockdown, you know, adamantly, vehemently, because I didn't think it was gonna do any good but what triggered my then anger and uh, was, uh, was uh, certain Metro mayors, including Mayor Hancock, trying to go beyond the governor's leadership, meaning they wanted a more strict and stringent uh, lockdown than what the governor was doing, longer, harder. And my point was, you know, in general, the lockdown is going to hurt people and it's not going to take care of the coronavirus. And we're going to be stuck at the end of the eight weeks or whatever it is with small businesses out of business and no capital, uh, no powder dry, so to speak. Um, and uh, the governor's the person calling the shots, right? Recently, um, I got upset again with Weld County because, you know, I didn't flip flop. I was just saying, let's follow the governor. Don't go rogue. Just like you shouldn't lock down, you also shouldn't ignore social distancing. We need to follow the governor. The concern I have with what I heard, if you, if you, you don't need to throw it back up, but Mesa County has a five-star program. It was very simple. Mm -hmm. The Colorado Department of Public Health then has some recommendations. What I heard was yet another instance. You know, I, I'm, I told you I'm supportive of this, the five-star program. What mm -hmm. I'm not supportive of is what appears to be yet another race of let's get the businesses to do even more things to shut them down. Mm -hmm. um, the H2 sol solutions list um, seems, first of all, I, as a small business owner, I was getting exhausted just reading the list. To get a concealed carry permit, you need a letter from the sheriff. They're busy. You know, mm -hmm. I mean, it's uh, getting letters from everybody and, and going through all, I mean, I, I just, I just think it's prohibitive. No, uh, I, they don't get letters. I want to be clear I, that the yeah. letters of support are for, are at the county's application to CDPHE to stand up a program. That's not a requirement of businesses. To okay, what would, so my concern, so, so when you say that the H2 solution, so I guess I'm, it seems like they're, they're a little muddled. If I'm a small business owner, tell, once we get approval of the five-star program, mm -hmm. what do I need to do? Because what I heard was apply every eight weeks, pay 75 to $100 every time I apply. No. Um, I'm, so help me understand then, because... Right. What do I need to do as a small business owner in order to go from orange to yellow, red to orange, et cetera? Yep. So you, um, once the program is stood up, you as a small business owner would apply one time uh, to okay. the program. Um, so you'd make one application, pay one application fee, and that includes the every eight week recertification uh, for the duration of the program for as long as the program is needed. Certainly if we're having this conversation a year from now, there will probably be a reassessment if that's, if that's and, and again, um, the feasible on an the ongoing basis. So again, I don't care about the 75 to to $100. Right. I care about classes, applications. It just seems very burdensome. You, you complete your application, you pay your application fee. Um, H2 sends out um, an inspector. They actually create for you the action plan, which is um, different than other programs that re require you to determine for yourself how to um, meet the public health requirements that would qualify you for certification. So H2's auditors are actually providing that scorecard and action plan for you. You as a business implement that action plan, um, which could be things like, um, or are likely to be things like EPA approved cleaners versus, um, the ones that you bought at the grocery store, um, social distancing, ensuring everybody wears masks. So for the most part, um, uh, not very onerous from a financial perspective, things to implement. Though again, we'll have some resources available uh, for businesses that have um, greater needs to implement in order to meet those certification requirements. Once you've 
done all of the things that you need to do to get to a level that makes you eligible for certification based on that action plan that's provided for you. You receive your certification, an auditor comes back out every eight weeks and um, recertifies you, assuming that you are continuing to do all the same things that uh, um, you, your certification was approved based on. If you're not, you get a new action plan, you implement that action plan, you get your, your new certification. So, so, so your answer is, hey, for all you lazy people, H2 will do it for you. You invite them out, they come up with mm -hmm. an action plan, create a scorecard, you do what they say, Mm -hmm. They send off the application and they do all that stuff to make sure that everything's kosher. Yes. Okay. I'm, I'm cool with that. That the <laughs> higher level of rigor, I will say is in the number of things that they're inspecting. And I'll be quite candid in saying that um, CDPHE is pretty insistent that an application come from a county. If a county were to choose not to do it, then an individual municipality could make application on their own. Uh, but it also requires that a member of the local public health authority um, be a part of your administrative committee. So ultimately that local public health authority has to support your program and anything with any less rigor than what we're presenting with the H2 um, solution would not have passed muster with Boulder County or Boulder County Public Health. And we would not be moving forward with. So, um, so, so when you say, you, when you say, it's it's it goes above and beyond Mesa mm -hmm. County or the Colorado Department of Public Health. What you're talking about is your administrative team and making the initial application, right? Exactly. Not traditional stringent, you know, uh, government bureaucracy right. hoops that you have to jump yes. through if you're a struggling restaurateur, right? Right. Yeah. And in fact, my point before we we tra we're trying to make it as easy as possible for the business by providing them. Okay. Um, an action plan to pursue versus, um, you know, figure it out and let us know when you're done. We'll come and check. If you're not there, we'll tell you you're not there, but we're not going to give you an action plan to get there. All right, perfect. I, my so, concern has been resolved. A couple of issues on this that I wanted to talk about. So part of it is um, in terms of how this is staffed, um, we're looking and, and you're going to hear repurposing a couple of times tonight, but in this case, um, staff members because of uh, the number of people we can have in facilities or some of the folks that we had to, uh, when we talked about the 25% reduction in hours um, at the rec center, we're looking at potentially working with those individuals to bring them on and give them the opportunity to be uh, the inspectors in this and we can use CARES funding for that. So that helps us deal with some of those issues we have internally. Um, and we're going to be meeting to discuss that issue. There's also other private companies that are willing to, to repurpose some of their staff. So cities are going to be coming in with some of the folks to be in those inspector positions. Um, and it helps us solve another issue that's in play in this one. To the point, we're going to be doing that work. Um, the other piece based on that that I wanted to clarify with council is at least my recommendation is to have Joni sit on this committee because it's going to be a, a, a pretty in-depth working committee and she's already working on with the economic group on some other things. And so that, that's been my recommendation um, in terms of one application for at least from a staff perspective um, is I've asked Joni to apply. All right. Well, thank you very much, Jessica. That was, that was good. So what do we need to do? Just that we'll just sit back and wait anxiously. Yeah. I mean, if there's any heartburn, let us know now, cause we're, we're moving. Move on, get her done. Thank you very yeah. much. All right. All right. Thank you all. Goodbye. Or is that council member Peck wanting to say something? Yeah. Council member Peck. Not leaving yet. Okay. Um, so Jessica, I, I just wanted to voice what everyone else has about what an incredible job you've done. And the frustrating part for me of all of this is that if everybody would just comply with the rules to begin with, we wouldn't have to jump, you know, have this circus. So yeah. um, thank you for helping us work it out. And I agree with you that it does set the stage for uh, what we do the next time this, this happens, because this won't be the last pandemic, I'm sure. So thank you again. Yeah, all of us to that point, all of us that have been working on this over the last number of weeks uh, agree that we don't want to be in this position, um, but here we are. And so we're trying to figure it out. Exactly. Amen to that one. All right. Thank you very much. Well done. Thanks, Jessica. Thank you. Thanks.
Next presentation is Roberto on the wastewater information you all requested. It was posted publicly. And so Roberto's going to come on. We've got about 10 slides there. And then I'll take it after Roberto on a number of issues I need to update you on. So Roberto, Susan, can you bring that up? Good evening, Mayor Bagley, members of council. I'm Roberto Luna, Water Quality Laboratory Supervisor with Public Works and Natural Resources Environmental Services Department. I'll be providing an update on the city's SARS CoV-2 wastewater monitoring program, <clears throat> specifically on the state health department's public dashboard and on the graphical representation of SARS COVID monitoring data that is provided to city manager Harold Dominguez and deputy city manager Dale Rademacher. Next slide, please. I wanna start with a brief history of the program. <clears throat> In March, 2020, we initiated uh, weekly sampling with BioBot. In August of 2020, uh, through an IGA with the State Health Department, we transitioned to our participation with a Front Range Collaborative uh, and increased sampling to twice a week with CSU performing the analysis for the virus. In November 2020, we moved to increasing sampling to seven days a week with the extra samples analyzed by GT Molecular as recommended in the IGA. And in, 2000, in December 2020, um, the CDPHE released the public dashboard. A goal of the collaborative was communication and data sharing with policymakers, local public health agencies, and the public through the use of a public dashboard. Uh, the first step in this goal was to develop a collaborative dashboard uh, to be used by the partner utilities. Next slide, please. This is the collaborative's private dashboard. It was the first step in the creation of a public dashboard. It's a private dashboard for the partner utilities so that we can review analytical results and supporting data prior to its release uh, to the public dashboard. The dashboard is interactive. It provides census tract data or county data for new cases and provides analytical results in various units, including copies uh, per liter and loading per day. Once the collaborative dashboard was essentially complete, the state moved to finalize its public facing dashboard. Next slide, please. This is the state health department's public facing dashboard. Um, once the analysis of the sample is complete, data is released to the private dashboard. Utilities have two days to review the data before it's released to the public dashboard. The public dashboard shows a graph of the viral concentration in copies per liter, and it has a separate graph with a three-day average of COVID-19 cases by onset date calculated using census tract data. There is an FAQ on the website that provides information uh, regarding the COVID-19 wastewater monitoring project. There is a, a link provided at the bottom of this slide uh, that takes you to the public dashboard. Next slide, please. So next, I would like to discuss our data evaluation. Uh, but before I begin, I would like to state that I'm not an epidemiologist, nor am I a medical expert. As a scientist and a laboratory supervisor, I have experience in reviewing analytical data and providing data analysis on laboratory results. Casey Campo and I have performed detailed data analysis on our SARS COVID-2 uh, results, but I wanna keep this presentation as simple and as non-technical as possible. So what, ha what have we done? First, due to comparability uh, issues, the BioBot data was dropped from any further data analysis. Second, we initiated a collaboration with Boulder County Health Department. They provide the city of Longmont with Longmont specific data and Longmont shares results and data analysis with Boulder County Health Department. Third, we performed statistical analysis of our data and Longmont having and having Longmont specific data and a larger data set helped us with our evaluation process. I would also wanna point out that the collaborative has performed similar statistical analysis of our data and of data from partner utilities. Finally, we provide our data analysis and graphical representation uh, to city manager Harold uh, Dominguez and deputy city manager Dale Rademacher and to the Boulder County Health Department. Next slide, please. 
the data that we provide is different from that which is presented in the sta uh, state's public dashboard. Uh, there's no doubt that the state's public dashboard provides great information on the front range monitoring efforts, but our data is more reflective of the city's um, of the city. There are two major differences. We have Longmont specific case data, and we use the additional GT molecular uh, data. The other differences are the use of a five-day averaging of new cases instead of the state's three-day average of new cases by onset date. Our statistical analysis indicated that five-day averaging worked better with Longmont specific data. We also initially began using copies per liter, but found that the loading data provided better information. The state statistical evaluation indicates that there really is no difference uh, when using viral copies or viral uh, viral copies per liter or viral copies per day. Next slide, please. So demographic data and biological data is complex and very noisy, uh, but epidemiologists and scientists have statistical methods for dealing with this kind of complexity. This is the up-to-date graph of the city of Lamont data for new cases and for viral loading. The square points are GT molecular data. The circular points are CSU data points. The blue lines are the five-day running averages of new cases. Boulder County provides the daily count and the five-day running average of new cases. And as you can see, the data is indeed complex and noisy. Next slide. But when you apply standard statistical methods, it smooths the data out and it allows you to clearly see patterns in the data and to obtain more information. Next slide. You can then take this data and visually smooth it to make it easier to see trends. Next slide. With this smoothing technique, we can show that viral loading tracks well with the five-day average of new cases. Next slide, please. Uh, many studies have uh, indicated that results from testing can be used as a leading indicator of new cases. Using statistical methods, we looked at Longmont's data. Uh, we looked at whether Longmont's data was indeed a leading indicator. The findings did indicate a very strong uh, correlation as a leading indicator anywhere from three to eight days. Initially, we saw the strongest correlation at seven days, but this has slowly been moving toward less days. The graph above displays this information, but what does it mean? Simply put, it means that today's results are a window of what may happen in about three to seven days. Next slide, please. Finally, this is the latest graphic that contains all the information that we have been sharing with City Manager Harold Dominguez, De Deputy City Manager Dale Rademacher, and the Boulder County Health Department. The graphic is a combination of five-day averages of new cases, the viral loading concentrations, and the level of restrictions that have been put in place. Next slide. In this slide, we mark the dates for Halloween, Thanksgiving and Christmas. So what have we learned from this project? First, we can say that viral concentrations do trend with five-day averages of new cases. Trends are important. Second, we can say that the data can be used as a leading indicator of new cases. And finally, this is an investigation. It's a study that is ongoing. And as we get more data, and as we add more data, we will refine our findings and we will have new findings. Next slide. Thank you. If you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer. Uh, thank you. I guess the one question, I, uh, Mayor Pro Tem Rodriguez, let's go with you. Uh, thank you, Mayor Bagley. I'm just wondering if there's any conversation at all because there's been speculation about the new strain of COVID and when it hit the United States whether it was not a, a function of Halloween versus a function of whether it was the new strain that caused the surge in the cases 
I'm just curious if there's conversation about that or how they are reconciling that within the data, considering it's supposed to be much more uh, transmissible. I, I have not heard any conversation with regard to going back to Halloween and looking at whether uh, it was caused by the new strain of the coronavirus. Yeah, I don't think, I, don't, I think it's hard to say. Um, I think the other thing is, and part of a lot of the conversations is we all know virus continually mutate anyway. And so there's a natural mutation that's occurring with this. To your point, at least what you're starting to hear from a preliminary perspective is the new strain they're thinking may be actually more transmissible at a younger age um, because of what it looks like. But again, everybody's still saying we need to wait and see what they are saying is is that they still do predict that the vaccine will still work on this based on the virology that you're seeing on this and so it very well could have tested in this because you're using the same rna components correct uh, roberto yeah it's the same rna components it doesn't change from one mutation to the other we're still looking at the same at the same uh, uh, genetic code uh, i understand i was wondering if there's conversations looking at whether the surge was actually based off a of person-to-person -person transmission of the standard strain that we've known about for a while versus a, a, an influx of a new strain. Uh, that, that was my question, because as, as we know, it is new, and so the data is always changing. Yeah. So, so, so Mayor Bagley, uh, Council Member uh, Rodriguez, I, this is an ongoing study, and I think the more data we collect, I, this study is going to be important because we're going to look backwards and then we're going to understand what we were seeing. And that will help with future pandemics or a future outbreak of this COVID-19. So I think right now we, we, we need to look and, and maintain this data, continue to collect the data, and then hopefully the experts will be able to look back and really tell us what we were really truly seeing. And right now, the only two conclusions that we can have really are that it's a leading indicator and that trends are important. Council Member Water, Waters. Yep, Council Member Waters. Thanks, um, uh, Roberto and to Dale and, and Harold, thanks for bringing this to us. I, I, I've been curious kind of where we are and this is a good update. Um, I am, I am, I have a couple of questions. One is um, you're, you're gonna start to make some inferences based on the data. I understand you're gonna look back, but the more, the more uh, data, the more evidence there is of this as a reliable leading indicator, you're also gonna look forward. Um, so what are the explanations or what are you speculating uh, about possible explanations for a decrease in the number of days between leading indicator and manifestation, right, or evidence of an outbreak or of uh, the implication of infection, number one. Um, and number two, um, what are the, can you give us an example of a decision or two um, that you're in real time that you can make or you are making based on what you've concluded now as a leading indicator. Because of that, we can say X, Y, or Z about uh, what's gonna show up and how do we get in front of that? How do we inform hospitals or healthcare providers or you know, who gets that information and what do we do with it? Is there any relationship between these data and what we heard a bit ago from, from Jessica and, and what our business community should be advised of or looking for and get ready, right? if they're in the five-star program and to anticipate what might be coming based on data that shows up tomorrow. So I'm gonna take the decision-making process um, on this and kind of talk about it. So A, we've obviously been through valleys with the data, with the copies that we've seen peaks and we can understand what kind of cases are related to those peaks to, to all the information Roberto was going over. So for us, as we talked with the health department, it's here's what we're seeing. Hospitals, you may need to get ready. If, if it's something that we see that's, you know, if we start seeing something above what we've seen, we're going to start having conversations about it. I think for us, the practical application is when you start seeing this to really inform your public information campaigns in terms of how we need to communicate with businesses, individuals, and really let them know that, I mean, it's a point of, I think had we have had this data ready early on, we could have probably intervened and messaged much differently in October, hopefully then limiting the extent that we saw in the peak. And, 
And so for me, it's really going to be about that public information piece and messaging based on what we think we're seeing. It's kind of hard to get much more specific, um, again, because it's this is an evolving process. And Roberto keeps beating me on the head with that. So it's looking high level on this and going inform hospitals, inform public media strategy, and then have a sense of what we need to get ready for just in terms of our responses in various areas. Your scientific question, Dale and Roberto. If I could just um, just add to that real quickly, uh, Mayor Bagley and Council Member Waters, um, I think Harold's uh, right that the first and best use is to convey information to the public. Uh, we're really starting that tonight uh, with you all. And what I would <clears throat> anticipate is that in the event we see a significant spike uh, in, in the loadings, um, that would, I believe, cause us to want to um, share that information. And so I think we, we should have this information available to the public and certainly to um, uh, entities such as the school district or the hospitals or others. Um, what I wouldn't recommend doing is trying to um, get too fine with it uh, because the data is still pretty raw, it's, it's uh, pretty basic. And, and so uh, I, I do think though, information is always good for, for all people. But I would look at it in the sense of if, if it is a significant spike, similar to what we were seeing uh, back in uh, the middle of November. If we start to see that continue to climb, for instance, after uh, the New Year's uh, holidays and those kinds of things, uh, it, it's good information for the people to know because it will eventually impact, whether it be the hospitals or um, potential impact on our businesses to, um, to re remain open. All right, thank you very much, Mr. Luna. We, we really appreciate that. Thank you. Okay, thank you. All right, Harold, what's the next? We have one more report, right? Oh, I've got, I've got a few more. So All right. <laughs> let's keep going then. I'm gonna go fast. So um, the one thing I wanted to talk about um, is one of the things we're seeing in, as an organization and employers are starting to see this more and more is fraud alerts related to unemployment claims. And, and so, um, we've been communicating that with our staff. I was actually one of them. So this Saturday, I got a letter about my unemployment claim and I got the Relia card in the mail at the same point. Um, and so basically <clears throat> someone falsified an unemployment claim with me. How I got to my address, because they probably put a different one on there, um, it did. And, and so what we're seeing as an organization is it's creating a lot of work for us within our human resources department, because as all of these claims are coming in, we're having to verify them. It wouldn't surprise me if some of you all have not been hit on this. Um, I, I knew one person was, I didn't know who, because they come into us. And, and so then we have to track it down. And so what I wanted to do is to alert, alert everyone I know that uh, the school district has put information out on this, but basically any employer is having to deal with this right now. Um, we're actually now having to go back because when this first started coming in, we knew that there were temporary staff members. So we know our temporary staff have different positions and we know some of them were no longer able to work. And we then have realized that they've come back to us and said, no, I didn't file. And so now we're having to go look at all of this at a much deeper level. And so from, from the community perspective, what I wanted to do is to make everyone aware that this is going on. And there are some things that we can do as a community when this happens. Um, and this is what we're telling our staff members. So when this occurs, um, and we're gonna put some information out on this, you can report the incident as a fraud um, to you go into the Colorado Department of Labor uh, fraud prevention area. Um, you also go to um, the Federal Trade Commission. I had to go there and fill it out. You then, if you get the rely card, you have to go to US Bank on that one. Um, and then many of those require you to file um, a report with local law enforcement to, to verify this. And, and then you need to call one of the credit monitoring agencies and let them know that this has occurred. Um, 
Jason Gates, who's our security person, um, and is fabulous, by the way, on this, has really said that this is not a Longmont thing. It's not a Colorado thing. It's a national thing that's going on. Um, and what they're starting to see is that um, in one month period in Colorado, um, he's estimating that somewhere around, I think, 48,000 of the 62,000 were claims were fraudulent. Um, and that what they're hearing on the computer side is that um, criminal organizations are working with hackers and, and then they're coming in and filing these complaints. And so, A, what I wanted to, to let the community know and let you all know, it's happened to me. Um, as you saw, it's happened to the mayor. Um, we need to be aware of this and we're gonna put this information out so people can do what they need to do to protect themselves. Any questions on that? No, but I just want to point out if we resign, we get paid. <laughs> All right, uh, Councilman Martin. Um, I've got a lot of people that, uh, and I'll ask about that later, that are on the other end of that stick. Um, but uh, uh, I want people to understand uh, what the possible consequences of ignoring this are. And I'm thinking it probably is that if sometime later you need to apply for unemployment, they'll think that you're not due as much. Well, it's that. It's also, chances are they have your social security number so that, you, you know, it could impact, they could be taking credit out in other ways on you. So that's why you need to let the credit um, agencies know about this. There's any number of pieces to this that could be problematic for the individual. But you're not going to get in trouble if you report the fraud. No, not at all. You have to yeah, report. Yeah. What happened? I got I got fired from the city and the law firm at the same time. So uh, they're they're going nuts. Mayor Pro Tem Rodriguez. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Mayor Bagley. This is just a question more for folks that are probably or could possibly be dealing with this. What would be the easiest way to find out if you have been a victim of said fraud? So, a letter. <clears throat> so typically there's two ways that this is coming forward. One, you receive a letter or two, it hits your employer and your employer is tracking it down. So we're seeing both of those. We're seeing it from the standpoint of, in my case, I got the letter before HR was notified because it has to go through your employer and they have to deal with it. In some cases, HR is seeing it before individuals receive the letter. Um, um, other than that, I guess you would have to look at the Colorado Department of Labor to figure out how you can check this out. Um, sorry, I've got a... And that, that's pretty clear. Can we go on to the next one? Yeah, I'm trying to get my screen up so I can go over this and so I can... Uh, I want to talk a little bit about the economic relief update. So um, a number of changes happened late in the year. As we were hitting the end of the year and they were getting the, the, um, the second stimulus package passed and they did it, the, I believe the second to last day of the year, what it also did was extend the time frame on the CARES funding. So while everyone's screaming to try to spend the money in time, they then extended it at the last minute and so gave us some options, but I wanted to update you on some information that's going, going to go out, hopefully tomorrow or the day after. So. In terms of the business boost grants, um, we received about 182 applications. Um, we had about 100, we had 165 eligible applications. Thus far, we've awarded 97 grants. And I say thus far because we're still looking at some other opportunities in terms of funding on this. Um, based on what we were trying to spend and the movement of money that I talked about with you all in December, um, we have put out uh, $1,327,000 and change into our local businesses. The total amount requested was $2.6 million. The grant amounts range from $5,000 to $15,000. The majority received the maximum. Uh, we also have a map that they're going to um, release that shows the locations because we wanted to make sure that it was really equitably spread throughout the community as we were doing this. Of those that were funded, six were personal care service, six nonprofits that couldn't fit in the other nonprofit categories. We had nine others, which includes uh, community centers and childcare, 
arts and entertainment, construction, events, and transportation. Um, 11, health and wellness. 11, manufacturing. 12, professional services. 18, retail. And 24 that were in the restaurant bar classification. Um, we also um, were working on the child care. We had the 700,000 that we were, we were moving through on that. And um, what we did in that process, and I'm going to stop here and, because it really started coming into play in child care. One of the things that we had to do both in the business side and in the child care side was go through all of the requirements that exist in the federal government. And one of those was duplication of benefits. And that became a pretty significant issue for us because the PPP loan actually was one of the triggers for the duplication of benefits. So if you receive the forgivable PPP loan, that we couldn't give you money out of the CARES funds because that would have been considered a duplication of benefits. Now, what we figured out that, or what Peter figured out that we could do is actually then take and work with the business to say, give us what your total loss was. And if there was money left over after the PPP loan, then you could allocate that to the grant process. And so there was a lot of work that we had to do with the businesses and with the child care. On the child care side, but we also started seeing too, a little bit on the businesses, this also had a tax implication to it because they had to claim it as income. And so certain people then were making other decisions based on the tax side of it. Obviously because it was um, federal dollars, um, individuals had to be documented. So that was another piece. So the review criteria, criteria on this was significant. They moved through it um, in the child care side. We knew that we probably weren't seeing all of the child care in it. And so I asked our staff to go back out and personally call those child care agencies so that we could reaffirm whether or not they wanted to apply. Some did, and we came back into the process. Um, we were able to provide um, grants to 20 child care providers in Longmont. Um, um, to utilize that 700,000. It's different, I mean, and there's more significant differences there based on the size of the child care providers and their, um, the losses that they incurred in looking at the duplication of benefits. Um, we're gonna send you more specific information on that, um, but I wanted to give you an update in terms of where we, are, where we are today. Obviously, as additional stimulus packages continue to come out, hopefully there'll be more money um, in the future but that's where we sit today in terms of uh, the boost grants and the child care grants. Right. And Questions? I don't know why, but my, my, inter my internet connection reset, so I missed about two minutes of what you had to say, but we're okay. okay. All right, any, anybody have any comments, questions? All right, great. Let's keep going, Harold. Um, I don't want to take up, I'm going to just show you all some slides real quick on the numbers. Um, because the numbers are continuing to change. Susan, I'm gonna share my screen. Um, we see it. Okay. So when we look at where we are in the dial um, and you look at the two week cumulative incident rate, um, and this was as of yesterday, I believe. Um, hold on, I gotta move this. Um, it was sim as of 1421, it was similar to last week. I did check it and it looks like we went back into red. Um, and so we're right at that cusp as we're moving back and forth. Um, but one of the things that changed this week was that the governor obviously um, moved everyone to level orange. And uh, that was something that happened late last week um, that was um, a bit of a surprise to us, um, as well as some of the changes to the vaccine piece that I'll cover after I go through this. Um, when you look at the cumulative incident rate, 4.3, I think it did go up again today. Um, and then when you look at the Boulder County status, seven days of decreasing or stable admissions, um, we're actually in the red now. And, and I want to pay, I want to bring some attention to this. When we look, and I asked Dan today, how many people did we have in the hospital? The number was 50. Um, Remember that number was 80 and above when we were in the peak of this. And so part of this number that we're talking about, and, and I'm gonna have a conversation with the other administrators is that 
if you're at 80 and you go to 50, but then you go to 50 up to 60, that counts against you, even though you're still below the peak. And, and so what I want people to know is, yes, we've had more people go into the hospital, but we're still lower than we were at the peak of this based on the information that, that we received um, from Dan today. And so we need to really, this is how CDPH, CDPHE captures it, um, but there's more behind this information. When you look at this and you remember the information I just provided, this, this shows you what's happening in, in the other counties. So you can see that um, outside of Gilpin, um, Broomfield and, and Boulder tend to be lower, Jefferson's close, Larimer's now closer, um, Weld is at 567, Grand's at 547. When you look at the two week average in positivity um, in terms of the numbers we were seeing on this chart, based on when the data was presented, um, you know, we're still lower there. You can see the hospitalization information here. And so um, this is where we need to spend some time working on it. But again, Boulder County and Broomfield are still doing better than most of the counties. When we talk about level purple and some of the pieces on the data that you all were discussing in the Five Star program, um, uh, our hospitals are saying they're not approaching crisis standards. No one's using alternative care sites. We have one of the five hospitals um, are reporting anticipated staff shortages. And regionally, 17% of the hospitals are reporting anticipated staff shortages, five of 30. Um, approaching 90%, um, Boulder County is at 78% of med surge and 78% of ICU beds. Um, no hospitals are reporting an anticipated ICU bed shortage. Um, transfer capability two are reporting tight ICU capability. Again, that's broader ICU. Um, and then none of our regional hospitals report um, greater than 10% um, ICU or less than 10% ICU uh, uh, bed availability. Um, so again, that looks pretty good. When we look at the caseloads, you can see in this information, um, we, we have and we continue to decline. Um, from the 28th through the 3rd, we had six days under 100 cases. Um, one day had over 100. We just added another one on this one of, well, 28th. We had 130 just before the 28th and then 106. So obviously, if you remember, we're doing much better than we were earlier on in the peak. Um, when you look at this, you can also see how it's related to long-term care facilities um, and the impact there. That's kind of going to touch on that when I talk about vaccines here in a little bit. Um, and then this is what our five-day average number of new cases looks like within Boulder County. Um, it's about 83. Um, um, and it's increased since last Tuesday when we were about 79. So, um, but again, better than, than where we were um, prior to the, um, the new year. Again, what you can see here is you can see Boulder, Broomfield in the light blue. Um, some of the other counties are starting to get closer, but still as a metro region, region we're doing well. Adams, but you're seeing this slight tail here where it's starting to move up. And so those are all things that we're watching. Um, when we look at Boulder County, um, I think the big piece is uh, since November 1, Longmont has had the, the highest case rate per 100,000 out of, um, but the other municipalities, Lafayette, Boulder, Lyons, they've also had high case rates since that time frame. Um, in the past seven days, 33% of the new cases have been in Boulder and 39 have, have resided in Longmont. Um, again, when you see this, this is just um, more of that information. Uh, when you look at the weekly cases, Boulder had 172, Longmont had 233, Louisville, Lafayette, and Superior had 74 cases, and then the other unincorporated area municipality had 80. Um, again, this shows it by age range. And then when we look at our uh, children 0 to 17, um, the case rates have decreased for eight, every age group over the past two weeks compared to the previous two weeks. And this is showing you by age group here. Um, we, are, we did see cases among 25 to 34 year olds increase by 3%, uh, while cases among our oldest and highest risk age groups have increased 
Um, and again, this is a percentage on a small number, 53% in the 65 to 74 year olds and 12% in the 75 plus. And if you remember, we saw a big increase in assisted living facilities in that data. Um, uh, 75, um, when we look at the race and ethnicity on this, we can continue to see persistent large disparities among our Hispanic population. Um, one of the things that we are seeing in this, when you look at this chart, um, um, while the disparities continue, um, the case numbers and the proportion of cases among Hispanic uh, community members has decreased over the past several weeks. Um, up until last week, which we saw a slight increase in the number of cases, but not in the proportion of it. Um, and then when you look at testing, you can see this is an update based on the other slides. 5.4% is the five-day average. Um, a month ago, it was 7.6. Um, this looks at the number of tests that we're performing and uh, the number of positives. The rolling percentage, you can see where we've moved down. That also may be a product if we back up. We've had fewer tests being performed compared to what we've seen earlier. Um, when you look at the hospital, this is also a cumulative data. Um, but when we look at this, I think the big difference is, these are slides provided by Boulder County Health. Um, you see a lot more in green. Um, med search beds are in red, but remember that also can, can contains elective procedures. And then the ICU beds are there too, and that may have other people with other medical issues beyond COVID. Um, and this is what the hospitalization for Boulder County looks like. Again, um, what we're looking at is the trend here. And I think that's part of when you then look at what's happening in the state was the impetus for the governor moving everyone to orange. It's, it's, we're in a much different position. Everyone's still though um, ca cautiously optimistic. And then unfortunately, when you look at the deaths, um, you can see um, that we've hit some pretty high numbers recently. Um, in Boulder County, and, and I think what you're also seeing is associated with long-term care facilities, and you saw that increase that we saw um, in the number of cases in our long-term care facilities. Um, and then when we look at social distancing, um, statewide we're at 48 percent compared to 40 percent last week, 50 percent before that. When we look at Boulder County, um, we're at 48 percent. It was 53 percent but we're still at a higher social distancing rate than we were um, in, in October when we saw the peak occur. So the, this is all the data that we're starting to, to look at. Um, and, and we're also comparing that to the BioBot information. We're not doing BioBot anymore. Well, the, this, the wastewater testing with the other agents. I, just show, I was just showing you that I was paying attention, yeah. Harold. Just Good. showing you that I was paying attention. All right. Um, All right. Uh, Councilor Martin. Thank you, Mayor Bagley. Um, I am wondering, since um, we look pretty good on the dials except for uh, hospitalization utilization, um, is is are these numbers corrected at all for the fact that the hospitals in densely populated areas like us uh, draw from a wider area than just our locality, um, both for elective procedures and for very serious COVID cases potentially? Um, that's the question that I asked today and we're gonna have to start tracking it down because that's what I talked about the, the anomaly in this. And, it, and so I, I wanna get some more information on that. Thank you. So, uh, uh, yeah, thank you, Harold. Uh, thank you, Mayor Bagley. Um, just a question. I, I know that I have expressed this via email to Harold at this point, but with the governor's decision to move red to orange um, and also seeing some of the, the data we've just now seen, it seems to be a very good possibility, not that it's, it's guaranteed by any stance that there could be a surge based off of holiday activities. Um, how likely are we to see the governor's decision rescinded 
and pushing these restaurants, for instance, back into uh, outdoor dining only. And as such, are we as the council, and this is to my greater council members here, are we as a council willing to continue to allow, I know we said we're gonna be consistent with the, the governor, but how much do we want him dictating it seems to be somewhat whimsically at this point, at least with this most recent decision, because I just did not see the data. And I, most of the time I, I could defend the data that he was looking at too. I don't, I didn't understand this move uh, as far as it could be really catastrophic to some of these restaurants to open up, close down, open up, close down, open up, close down and flip flop. If we could keep looking at this data at a very narrow level. So that's just my question on, on, that I posed to Harold as well as to uh, now my, my colleagues on council is uh, I almost am ready to defend our restaurant tours considering what could be a somewhat tumultuous decision-making process over the next week or month or so, especially considering the holidays as well as the winter season. So if I can jump in a little bit on the data piece. So I think one of the things, and again, um, this was a bit of a surprise to a lot of us. Um, but I think if you, if you look at the data, everybody was anticipating a, a, a spike or a peak related to Thanksgiving. And we really didn't see that in terms of the state. We actually were continuing to decline in December. Um, when we look at the wastewater data, and we start seeing what's happening in that three to seven day window. It looks like there may have been a little bump in Christmas, but it didn't bump to where we were before that. The big thing that I think they were looking at, and I've got to go back to the beginning of this pandemic, that where everyone was really talking about it was really the impact on the medical systems and the hospitals. And I think the biggest change that we've seen is the number of hospitalizations, if you remember that graph, where we were moving down. So I think that was part of the impetus. Um, and then I think also there was a recognition at the state level, and I think they said this, of the um, press from businesses coming to them where they were literally at a breaking point of not being able to survive. That being said, I think it also corresponds with the five-star program because the five-star program, if you go in and do this and, you, and it's moved into red, it still allows them to stay open, which, helps with that vacillation of open close because we did have a number of restaurants locally that said, we're just going to close until we can ensure that we can stay open because of the amount of money they lose in product and everything that they can't use because they're closed in a day. My gut tells me it was the business pressure and, and the dire straits that some are in it was the five-star program and it was the hospital that led to that decision. I'm obviously not in the room. I'm just banking on what I've seen in the data, but I think the five-star program is gonna be the key piece in this. Did that, I mean, that's my thought. You all can jump in. Well, I just wanna say real quickly that I, I am a proponent of the five-star system. Um, <clears throat> I have some similar, uh, I guess, concerns to the mayor as far as how we're implementing that as well as the way that Boulder County is deciding to implement that. But regardless of that, I, I do agree with getting the five stars, five star system into place as fast as is humanly possible. So we can at certain points, I guess, and it wouldn't be us anyway, obviously, because we're not the county health, uh, uh, but implementing these kind of variances for the really good actors in, in the community. And I don't think they should be penalized in any way for people that are not taking it as seriously by any standard. My, my point is that it's very easy to defend the, the governor when it's very consistent and data-driven. When he starts to make decisions that don't make as much sense based on the data, it becomes much more difficult to, to toe the line, if you will. And so that's my question is, I've also heard obviously some rumors about the depletion of certain funding at the state level and that has also driven some, some decisions at the state level. That's hearsay, that's anecdotal. Um, 
and I'll admit that that now, but I've, I've heard these things. And so I'm just curious as if, if the metrics change for the decisions at the state level, can we still as confidently uh, back those same decisions? And that's, again, a hypothetical question to my colleagues on council. It's not based on what we're hearing right now because we don't know. We simply don't know at this point. John? Sorry, John, we're back. Um, I actually, uh, Mayor Pro Tem, I agree with you, but to Harold and possibly to Jessica with the five star program, is Boulder County looking at, as vaccines increase, the ability to possibly go beyond the 50% capacity if someone has proof that they have taken the vaccine? Um, and are we looking in, <coughs> excuse me, in Boulder County at some kind of a card or a, a phone app to show that we have gone above and beyond? We've got the vaccine, uh, still wear a mask, but I would think that the capacity would probably be skewed or change a little bit with that. Uh, it is something I think that needs to be addressed. So at least what we're hearing on the vaccine side right now, um, and I'm gonna talk about this. Uh-oh, did we lose council member Peck? Oh. Oh, sorry. Oh. <laughs> um, I think part of it, what we're hearing in terms of the vaccine is even if you get it, you still, the masking requirements are still gonna be in play. Because what they don't know, and this is the hard part, it's not those that are vaccinated, it's those that aren't vaccinated that become the concern. Because what they don't know right now is whether or not, if you're vaccinated, you may still shed the virus and potentially um, infect other people. So until there's more, vac I, I think that may be something they look at further once they get more people vaccinated in the state. Um, but um, there's those com there, that conversations in the mix, but they're still pretty adamant about if you're vaccinated, you still need to wear your mask because we're not sure that you're, you can't potentially infect someone else. Um, speaking of vaccines, there was another change uh, that occurred um, late last week. Oh, sorry. There's another question, Mayor. You're muted, Mayor Bagley. I said I'm. You're muted. I said I'm working at the. I've been working at the computer all day, and my eyes are are uh, having a hard time seeing the screen. The water and it's stinging pretty bad. But I saw a bright red movement in Dr. Waters. That must have been you. Thanks, uh, Mayor Pro Tem. Asked a question. I just wanted to respond. Um, I. Uh, like a lot of people, um, you and I and others uh, have wondered about the basis for some of the decisions the governor made last week, because the data it did, didn't seem to square with the data. I, I, I agree with that. I have to say, though, I, I have two concerns. I share the, the aspirations that we do all we can to support our local businesses, especially our hospitality industry. Um, however, once, once we pull the pin, that we, we've decided we're going to selectively uh, comply with the mayor, mayor with the governor, um, then I think it's a free for all. Then we're going to spend a lot of time on Tuesday nights arguing whose data is going to be the data or the data. I, I think that's dangerous, number one. I think we made a good decision. When we made the decision, like it or not, we're going to, we're going to follow the, the governor. That was, that's the decision we made together. Once we, once we take a step back, I think it's a free for all. And that whoever has the, you know, makes the best point, I guess, on a Tuesday night, or we simply don't comply with, with anything the governor has to say. I, I think that becomes a, a concern. The other, the other is, is we did that. I, I would, I would want to, I would want to be in really close touch with our healthcare providers, because what I wouldn't want to do is do, do to our health healthcare providers, our hospitals, and others what I think the Well County Commissioners have done to theirs, 
or that other municipalities have done. I mean, I, you look at our, our hospital rates and I, and I think, hallelujah, we, we still have capacity. But I, I just, I, I look at the news reports and the, the, what, what is happening to the healthcare system that's about to collapse and the people in it, and we just can't ask much more of them. So, it, you know, and the, I don't wanna trade off hospital or I don't wanna trade off hospitality industry for healthcare workers. We're gonna figure out how to, we gotta figure out how to do this in a way that doesn't put those people who are on the front lines of keeping people healthy to put them over the edge in the interest of trying to keep restaurants open. I, even as much as I wanna keep restaurants open, I just think we have to take, take a real thoughtful approach if we're gonna not comply with what the governor's orders are. Okay, thank you. Anybody else? All right, Harold. Um, so the last piece is, oh, what's going on? So the vaccine, um, information changed also last week and we're trying to work with with that um and, and understand it so to let you all know what we were doing there it is i'm going to show you the screen this is from cdph -E. do you all see the vaccine screen yes on phase two um so this changed a little bit and so what you're seeing um and in, in 1b is the one that changed the most and so Coloradans age 70 plus, moderate risk healthcare workers, first responders, frontline essential workers, and continuity of state government. And so what they're looking at right now is, and what they're talking about is 1B above the line in terms of those that can be vaccinated. So um, we are running um, our firefighters and police through the system. The healthcare workers have been running through that. COVID-19 patients, home health, hospice, pharmacy, um, EMS is, is in that. Um, as part of that, there's also other positions that um, are, are related to law enforcement that in some cases are in public safety, but may not be in other organizations that they're included in that. Rangers is an example of that piece. The interesting thing that we've had to, to really look at is this COVID-19 response personnel. And so that's really looking at emergency operations folks in terms of how we've talked about it. So we're having a lot of conversations and then people age 70 and older. And that's gonna be important because until they can really tackle that group, what we're hearing today is they're not going to move to the group below the line. And what we're also hearing is that when a provider signs a contract with the state, they're also saying they're gonna hit the state guidelines. So there's a lot of conversations regarding this as we continue to move forward. To put it, put it in perspective for you all, what we're hearing is the state receives about 60,000 doses a week, of which 20,000 is going to healthcare and long-term care facilities. So then when you look at the remaining 40,000 and they're really focusing on that 70 above, and some of these other one be above the line. When you said, how long does it take? You know, what we're hearing is it could be March before we start moving into one B below the line. Um, and so then obviously late spring is we're moving into phase two, which is why when we talk about phase three, that's why we're kind of saying in the summer, early fall is, is what's in at least our mind as we're um, starting to, to consider this. Um, we're, we are working with Kaiser. They are a provider. Um, we are providing, you know, we're in conversations now with them on, on this issue. Um, but what we're all trying to be really focused on is making sure that the individuals that we include are in those categories so we don't have any issues. Um, we did make a run at saying um, critical infrastructure workers. Um, obviously, you see some of them below the line in 1B, potentially. Most of it's going to be probably in two. Um, and we were trying to, to say we needed them above the line and, but they're not there. So um, what we're doing today is there's a committee working in Boulder County. Dan Eamon's our representative with Shannon McVaney um, and they're working with a broader group in the county um, and, and they're working through these issues. They had to retool their plan last week because they were going down this road, it changed and they had to adjust it again one thing is that is very clear that I heard on my admin call today 
and I said, you're going to hear this again about repurposing is we know that the county health departments are going to need assistance when this comes into play. Some of the providers, the large providers like Safeway and Walgreens and CVS may need locations. And so what was made very clear to me in the admin meeting is that cities are going to have to step up to assist and facilitate this as we start moving forward. Um, and we may not have a lot of time. So I wanted to tell you this, as these things come up, I may very well have to make a decision that says, I need to use Lashley Street Station to help someone, or we may need to use a senior center to help these groups. And, but they are saying cities need to be part of that. I just wanted to let you know, we're gonna be responding to that real time. And mayor, council, I know this is a long update. It's been a couple of weeks and things have changed dramatically on us. Um, so I'll be happy to answer any questions. All right, I think we, we got- Thanks, Mayor Martin. Hold on, I, the, on, the screen's frozen. I don't see it. Can you guys hear me? Yep. All right, there we are. Councilor Martin. Thank you, Mayor Bagley. Um, I probably should have asked about this earlier when you were talking about PPP and unemployment, um, but we do have the new federal law out and uh, I am hearing a lot of confusion about availability of the different benefits from that law, especially uh, uh, landlord and tenant assistance um, and the date of the uh, the end date of the eviction moratorium, which that law extends at the at federal level to uh, January 31st. Um, and that was captured. The state did extend the it. The state did get that. Okay, I missed that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay, so good, because I've been telling people it would happen, but I wasn't sure. Yeah. <laughs> I found out today, this afternoon. Or okay. All right, so I'm not behind the times. That always makes me feel better. Um, so uh, the Colorado eviction moratorium also goes through January 31st. A lot of people are still really nervous about that because less than 30 days isn't a lot of time to react to that. And what I am hearing, uh, which is gonna be exasper exacerbated by the news about unemployment fraud is that a lot of people aren't applying for assistance because they are afraid to. They're afraid that if that they're committing a crime or they're gonna get in trouble somehow if they apply for um, uh, benefits from two different sources um, and uh, they're not sure where to go or what the priorities are. And unfortunately, the result of that is that too many people are doing nothing uh, when in fact, uh, well, my understanding is that the, the federal benefits want you to have sought help locally first. Um, so they're doing it backwards. And uh, so what I want to understand is, is, and get out in front of the public is where people go. And I also want, I think some assurance that if, if people tell the truth, they're not going to get in trouble. Um, so I don't know what, uh, I guess, Harold, I'd like you to say what people should do and what we're going to do to make it easier for them. So a couple of things. I think, A, if you need assistance, pour it into us and we will find a way to connect you to the appropriate agency. And we have some contact numbers and actually, um, Council Member Martin called me Friday, Thursday or from one day. One of those days. About our website. And, and one of the things that we realized is we have a lot of that information on the COVID piece, but we think what we realized is the further we get away from it, folks aren't going there. They may type in housing assistance or rental assistance. And what we work and what we found and what I found based on that question from Council Member Martin is some of those pages don't have the same information. So we're, I talked to Marika and we're gonna to work to retool that to make sure that's all over the place. So depending on how you search, you get there um, because I found some of those dead ends where it said we provide the service. So we're gonna clean that up a little bit. The key piece, what I would say is if you think you need help, 
connect to us via those numbers that we have on our website and the information we put out. It is our job. And when I say our job, it is the program administrator's responsibility to, to work individuals through that process to ensure that there's not a duplication of benefits and, and that we are applying the appropriate standards and procedures. If the individual is being honest with us and they're not committing fraud and we don't do it correctly, then the cities and the, the state, the cities, the county and the state are responsible. And that's what you hear us say in terms of the clawback provisions. They actually claw it back from us, not the individual, if we didn't do it right. And so when, when we talk about what we were seeing in the business and the childcare piece, it actually was in those conversations where we were having those discussions that Peter and Molly O'Donnell would pour out of it and then go to the state and ask the questions and then come back and work with the applicant and, and really were getting clarity in terms of, okay, if they receive PPE, PPP, it's not an automatic disqualifier. Do they still have needs beyond that? And that's the work we have to do. So I would say come in and those folks administering it will work them through the process. Thank you. That's very helpful. I'm writing down the time th that you set for this. <laughs> okay, so that we're now at 915 and we yep. have and we haven't hit public invited to be heard. So I'm going to ask that if there's unless there's something extremely pressing to say that we move on. Anybody? Okay. So let's go on ahead. Let's move on to first call public invited to be heard, but let's take a five minute break, hit the restroom, et cetera, while we open up the lines and let people queue in. All right, back in five. Okay, folks, for those that are watching our live stream, now is the time to call in for public invited to be heard. You can do so by calling our toll free number 1 888 788 0099. Again, that's 1 888 788 099. And when prompted, enter the meeting ID 875. 9083-2677. Again, that meeting ID is 875-9083-2677. You will enter our waiting room and then you will be admitted to our meeting. And when the meeting resumes, we will call on you one at a time by the last three digits of your phone number. So please mute the live stream because there is a delay and listen to us on your telephone for instructions. Thank you.
Hello for all of those that have joined the meeting now on your phone. Please make sure that you mute the live stream and that you listen for instructions through your phone. I will ask you to unmute by the last three digits of your phone number and you'll be able to state your name and address and you'll have three minutes. We will return to the meeting shortly. Mayor, are you ready to return? Uh, yeah, we're ready to return. I'm seeing Mayor Pro Tem and Councilmember Christensen. And whether everybody else gets back, we'll, oh, oh, boom, boom, boom. There they are. Dr. Water, is he back? There he is. All right, let's go ahead and start with first call public invited to be heard. Let's all keep time. How many do we have on the list? Mayor, we currently have 10 callers. I'm just going to wait a second for it to clear the live stream before I begin. And it looks right. like it's just doing that. All right. And then, and then let's go ahead and close the close the room so we don't go from 10 to 20. All right. I will begin with the first caller. Your phone number ends in 035. 035. I'm going to ask you to unmute. Hello. Hello. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, and I can hear myself in the background. Is it possible for you to mute the live stream? I will do that entirely. Thank you. There we go. All right, you may begin by stating your name and address for the record. Okay, thanks. Um, I am Jenny Black. I live at 2609 Elmhurst Circle in Longmont. Good evening, Mayor Bagley and Council Members Christensen, Hildago Faring, Martin, Peck, Rodriguez and Waters. The comments I'm going to make are about the Rogue Bike Park constructed in the Riparian Corridor along Left Hand Creek, which is item 12C on the agenda. I emailed the longer version of these uh, comments to council back in May, but did not speak to the council at that time. Just as background, I am the mother of two boys now grown with boys of their own. 
and concerned about what happened to the riparian way and seeking expert advice on boys and bikes, <clears throat> I sent the Times Call article of May 20th to my sons for review and comment. Both expressed empathy for the riders while recognizing that they must bear some responsibility for their actions. Their suggestions are incorporated in the following comments. I hope they will be helpful. Well, the creativity of these boys in building the course and in calling attention to a personal need or a perceived need for bike skill or bike skills course in this neighborhood is admirable. It is unfortunately in the wrong place. This is public land that has been set aside as a riparian way to protect both the river and the wildlife that use this corridor. This mistake, however, can serve as a teaching moment for the whole community to honor their petition request and or leave the course in place, allowing de facto continued use would not be the appropriate lesson. To remove the skills course and repair the area as soon as possible would, particularly if those involved in the destruction were to help working with the city and perhaps with the aid of concerned community members and wildlife restoration volunteers with whom the city has partnered on other projects. In addition, and equally important, after or while the repairs are being done, those interested in a bike skills park in this neighborhood could work with the city to plan and obtain funds for building one in a more appropriate place. In the meantime, Dickens Park with safe, although more distant access could be used. Taken together, these actions, which are consistent with option two being considered this evening, would serve as a lesson in environmental conservation and the necessity for compromise in civic planning and political action. Thank you very much for your consideration of these suggestions. All right, thank you. All right, next caller. And the next caller, your phone number ends in 347. 347, I'm going to ask you to unmute. Three, four, seven. Try hitting the star six on your phone if you hear me. There you go. Oh, thought I was already muted. This is Mary Lynn. I live uh, at um, 744 Atwood Street. And I'm recalling, um, I'm calling in regard to actually two issues. The first is I'm very, very concerned about the uh, very, very weak scientific justification uh, for the restrictions that Governor Paulus is continuing to put forth and that the city is unfortunately still complying with, which are, are devastating our, uh, our local economic community, especially our restaurants. Um, every week I look at the statistics that the city is using and I think as someone with a scientific training, how can they possibly justify this? How can they possibly justify the numbers of quote unquote cases when the international community is now working rapidly to um, make sure that PCR tests are, are never used, ever used to actually make case diagnoses? We don't know um, how many people who are sick at this time or, or dying are dying from flus A and B because the CDC uh, does not track the, is not tracking the flu this year. Um, I, I urge the city to, to recognize that the information that's coming to you while you're trying to be safe is, is very weak and you are restricting the rights of businesses, their natural right, rights, their constitutional rights to make a living and it has to be stopped. We have got to get the city back on track and people loving um, walking around in downtown Walmart and, and loving our city again. And uh, um, we, we, we have to recognize that whether the governor says it or not, whether the, depart the health department says it or not, it is the responsibility of the people who are carrying out these restrictions to make sure that they are actually uh, correct in terms of 
uh, your legal right to restrict people's businesses. And I know that's being questioned. I heard about another lawsuit today against a local business. I don't want to hear this. They don't want to be in this position. Please do the right thing and open them up. Thank you. All right, next caller. The next caller, your phone number ends in 452. 452, I'm going to ask you to unmute. There you are. Can you hear me? Yep. You may begin. Sherry Malloy, 2113 Rangeview Lane. Thank you for recognizing the beautiful life and life legacy of Nino Gallo tonight. In May 2020, the issue about the creation of a BMX bike course by area youth along the creek by Left Hand Park was discovered. Created without approval by the city, this course was not only very damaging to this section of the riparian corridor, it was also illegal. Obviously, the kids didn't intend to cause harm nor break the law, but that's what happened. At that time, due to COVID restrictions with kids not attending school, combined with pressure from parents, an online petition the youth created, and a Boulder Bike Group's involvement, this council directed natural staff, natural resources staff to monitor the situation. David Bell told me the parents and the bike group folks all realized what the kids had done was wrong. They just asked for leeway and time in hopes that the COVID impacts would be short-lived. The parents and bike group understood the bike trail would be shut down in the fall. That approach and rationale seemed to make sense at that time. Well, it's now January 2021, and while we all know COVID impacts continue to be significant, the kids have used this area for eight months, and it's time to get real and fix this unfortunate situation. Option two is how council should direct staff tonight. This means spending the money required to remove and restore all impacts to the disturbed riparian corridor, including the removal of the bike course. Council has a contingency fund that can and should be used to fund this project. Option three is out of the question, and option one reinforces improper behavior. What the kids did, though unintentional, was misguided and unacceptable. No one wants them to be held responsible for the $35,000 $35, price tag to repair the damage they caused. We looked the other way long enough, and it's time to make it right. As a parent of a dirt biking and male enthusiast, I get it. Kids will be kids, but that includes being res held responsible for their mistakes. There is a bike skill area at Dickens Farm, which is only two and a half greenway miles away with no street crossings. 2.5 miles is not far on a bike, especially when one realizes the entire argument for letting this continue eight months ago was to give the kids some exercise and enjoyment. Option one reinforces irresponsible behavior and teaches a dangerous civic lesson. As a retired teacher of 35 years, we should be using this as an opportunity to teach youth about the value of riparian areas and why it's necessary to respect and protect this space and other natural areas. 95% of all wildlife depend on healthy riparian areas for their survival. I would love to see a restorative justice approach where the youth involved might take responsibility for the harm caused and be involved in the repair project. That would be a win-win, full scenario, full circle scenario. As a volunteer with natural resources, I'm concerned about the previous efforts to plant natural vegetation in this area, which has not been successful due to the unintended abuse. I look forward to help with the restoration efforts. Thank you. Thank you. All right, next caller. The next caller, your phone number ends in 488. I'm going to ask you to unmute. Hello, uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can. You may begin. Okay. All right. Yeah, my name is Scott Cunningham. I live at 3771 South Narcissus in Denver and practice integrative internal medicine. My comments this evening are in reference to the climate action recommendation report published in June of 2020. I wanna begin by congratulating the council for embracing the very ambitious goal of 100% renewable, clean and safe energy by the year 2030. At the risk of stating the obvious, <laughs> I, want to I want to bring to mind that in order to reach this worthy and audacious goal by 2030, 
you can't afford to waste any time spent in distraction along the way. As an example, I'd like to draw your attention to initiative three, marked as RE3 in the recommendation. RE3 suggests that in conjunction with local utilities, by 2023, options and incentives will be provided for electric utility customers to participate in a demand response program that manages electricity use in the home to reduce peak demand, shift the peak load, or absorb excess production. I would suggest <laughs> that if all you have is a demand response program by 2023, you won't be even close to meeting your goal of 100% renewable by 2030. Now, in contrast, I'd like to focus on an aspect of the recommendation that I believe is right on target. I'm referring, of course, to RE5, which suggests that by 2021, a pilot renewable energy grid would be a huge step in the right direction. I agree with you that a renewable grid to include residential rooftop solar and a beneficial, sustainable, and above all safe electrification plan is absolutely critical to meeting your 2030 goal. So in conclusion, I recommend an aggressive, state-of-the-art, 100% renewable pilot to be implemented immediately to demonstrate to all observers that Longmont has acquired the technical expertise and possesses the collective will to create a fully functional, 100% renewable, smart, fully wired utility grid in 2021, effectively bringing Longmont's bright future into the present and positioning the city for first mover status and gaining recognition even nationally. Thank you very much. All right, thank you very much. And by the way, I love it when people like hit three minutes exactly, like exactly. So that last caller was like on. Anyway, next caller. Yes, the next caller, your, your phone number ends in 579. 579, I'm gonna ask you to unmute. Five seven nine. There you are. Do you hear us? Hi there. Hi. I do. Thank you, City Council, for taking my call. My name is Greg Zwart. I live at 2023 Sundance Drive. I've been a Longmont resident for over 40 years, and I'm calling regarding the proposed Rex uh, maintenance facility at the Ute Creek Golf Course. First of all, I'm an avid golfer, and uh, I voted in favor of the maintenance facilities at the Ute Creek Golf Course. I feel I was misled because I believe, I believe what I was signing up for was remodel or revamping the existing facility, not a relocation. Since then, I've learned that the facilities are planned to be relocated to the parking lot in the clubhouse, by the clubhouse. And, and I'm, I'm outraged that it wasn't disclosed at the time of the vote. That would have, uh, absolutely changed my vote along with many of my friends at Ute Creek. I have had the uh, privilege to play hundreds of golf courses, nice golf courses all over the world. Never have I seen a nice golf course with the maintenance facility by the clubhouse, by where all the uh, clients and patrons park. The nicest golf courses on the planet have done a fantastic job of hiding their maintenance facilities away from uh, the participants. Ute Creek is our, is Longmont's premier golf course. And I just hate to see it degraded by the exposure of the maintenance facility. After talking to several of my golfing friends uh, who also voted for it, they were disgusted that uh, the pr plan proposal was that uh, we were going to custom have a custom architectural building as a maintenance facility. 
instead of a standard efficiency building that could be uh, provided at its current location. I'm asking the city to please be financially responsible and please don't degrade the nicest golf course we have. Please keep the uh, facility in its original location. Thank you for your consideration. All right, next caller. The next caller is 681. Those are the last three digits, 681. There you are. Can you hear us? Yes, I can. Wonderful, you Thank may you. begin. Yes, Scott Pierce, 2017 Sundance Drive in Longmont. Uh, good evening, everyone, and Happy New Year. Uh, I too am addressing the city council regarding the proposed relocation of the Ute Creek Golf Course maintenance buildings. The current maintenance facility has been located along the Highway 66 area for 25 years for the original Ute Creek Golf Course layout that was designed by the Robert Trent Jones, the second golf architects. Now, as you know, the city of Longmont staff, which also happens to be the applicant here, is proposing to build a new facility right next to the existing clubhouse. This decision is opposed by several hundred of the homeowners who live all around the Ute Creek Golf Course and also many of your paying golf customers. Many of us have spoken with members of city council and city staff regarding our issues and the disapproval to move the facility, but we have not been provided any feedback to our concerns and the project continues to keep moving along behind closed staff doors. Our request is that the current facility off Highway 66 must be upgrade at it, upgraded at its current location and not relocated. The city applicant is justifying holding itself to a lesser design standard by citing development cost savings. We strongly disagree with this position. In addition to centrally relocating the maintenance in a waste yard, the city applicant is requesting variances to install a chain link fence and buildings with non-conforming sheet metal exterior designs. These variances exempt the city applicant from meeting building standards for design and compatibility with surrounding residential neighborhoods. Simply put, city staff is holding itself to a lower design standard than the surrounding homeowners and their HOAs are required to meet. In 2002, a non-public non administrative approval to move the maintenance yard was never acted upon and technically expired one year after the project inactivity. There has been no public discussion regarding the relocation issues since that time. Did you know that there are, are over 240 public and private golf courses in Colorado? And our research shows that none, zero of these courses have built a maintenance facility next to or even within 1,000 yards of their clubhouse. Even the Robert Trent Jones golf course designers and two other golf course architects indicated to us that they would never design a golf course with these two facilities in such close proximity to each other. Why should Longmont do this? Who does it benefit? Come on. We request that the current maintenance facility be upgraded at its current location and not relocated. The city must hold itself accountable to its own standards and abandon this preposterous, preposterous proposal that will devalue the premier golf course in Longmont. All right, our next caller, your phone number ends in 696. I'm gonna ask you to unmute. There you are. Can you hear us? Yes, I can. Can you hear me? We sure can, you may begin. Thank you. Um, my name is Chris Hammerschmidt. I live at 2619 Fernwood Place in Broomfield, Colorado. And I am calling in response to the businesses that are currently shut down in your city. I have looked at all the data on the Colorado website. I am a data analyst. I deal with a lot of data. And I pulled the data for the outbreaks, both the resolved and active cases for both Boulder and Weld counties. Most of the resolved cases were found in healthcare facilities and schools. In Weld County, a lot of cases came from meat processing facilities and the only cases in restaurants were due to staff testing positive. There are no members of the community that have tested positive from the restaurants and no deaths have resulted from the restaurants. The largest source of active community outbreak of about 2000 was at the University of Colorado and resulted in zero deaths. 
The whole food store on Pearl Street had 20 people test positive and no death. And the only grocery store in Weld County was King Supers number 117 with 28 confirmed lab staff cases. The other retailers in Weld County who had lab confirmed cases was Nature's Herb and Wellness Center and the Target and Greeley with six and 11 cases respectively. The only deaths have been in healthcare facilities and jails. I, um, I've been reading this book called The Transmission of Epidemic Influenza by R. Edgar Hope Simpson. Um, he states that viruses are seasonal, which is what we are seeing now, where you are seeing the rise in seasonal cases of a virus. Influenza in the North Hemisphere appears from September to April, exactly this time frame, with a peak in January. And in the southern latitudes, influenza appears from April to January. This is all well known. I am asking you to open these businesses instead of punishing them for something they have no control over. And this is the data that you guys should be looking at. And I will just, um, state a Facebook page from a restaurant here in Broomfield County. I'll make it short. This is a restaurant owner, and this is what, some of the excerpts of what he put in here. As I take a cart that has just <clears throat> had this handle sanitized, I think about my restaurant, which invested thousands of dollars so far on ink and paper to print disposable menus to ensure no touch, no two guests touch the same menu. As I watch the woman next to me pick up apples with her hand, check them over closely, and then put them back on the open pile and repeat this until she finds the perfect apples. The same thing that all the other people that day who want an apple will then do and then put those apples in their mouths. I think about the two-step sanitation process in place at my restaurant for all cutlery and dishes and glassware in between every single guest, and the sanitation of every every surface, guests touch, tables, chairs, salt and pepper shakers, et cetera. I just want to leave you with this. I don't think your five stars, your, your H2 solution, your five star mandate is, is what businesses need. They need to open. They are in despair. They are in desperation and they need your help to open right now. And none of the data that is on the Colorado website says that they are at fault for what is happening in this community. A virus goes viral. That's what a virus does. And so I thank you for your time. Thank you, Mayor, and for City Council thank members you, for listening to me. All right. Thank you. That's three. Thank you. Is that it? Or one more? Mayor, there's three left. The next <laughs> caller, your phone number ends in 949. 949. I'm going to ask you to unmute. Hi, my name is Ruby Bowman, 1512 Left Hand Drive. Mayor Bagley and City Council members, City Council should spend the funds necessary to restore repairing habitat on Left Hand Creek that was damaged by the illegal BMX track. Habitat restoration should be done as soon as possible. As you know from previous Council discussions, the city stream corridors are highly valued habitat in terms of species richness, and they serve as wildlife movement corridors. Environmental sen sensitive areas like Left Hand Creek should be protected. If residents want a bike course in their neighborhood, there is a proper way to advocate for their project, like attending a PRAB meeting and asking PRAB members to include a bike course as a park CIP project. It will probably have to be a CIP project because of the high price tag to build it. The illegal excavation of Left Hand Creek Bank was not the way to do things. I also ask council to consider requiring a restorative justice measure in dealing with the BMX course. Those who damage city property should be required to participate in repairing the damage. Thank you so much. All right, our next caller, your phone number ends in 789, 789. I'm gonna ask you to unmute. There you are. Thank you, good evening. 
My name is Shannon Klubine, and my address is 6469 Pulpit Rock Drive, Colorado Springs, Colorado. And I represent a group here called Make Americans Free Again. Dear City Council, thank you for staying up late with all of us tonight. We have reviewed the following information and have concluded the following concerning the COVID-19 pandemic. During the year of 2020, we witnessed the unlawful incarceration of millions of Coloradans without due process. Our right to travel freely was severely restricted. We watched our children's spirits dampen as their schools were closed and they were forced into online learning, depriving them of knowledge and social interaction. Our elderly grandparents were jailed inside nursing homes, deprived of fresh air, sunlight, and visits with loved ones. We were kept out of our religious and spiritual centers and told we could no longer have fellowship with others. Our businesses were forced to shut their doors, forcing many of us into poverty and or bankruptcy. Our fundamental rights granted to us under the U.S. Constitution were stripped away at breathtaking speed. This was all decided for us by Governor Polis and the unelected health officials at the Colorado Department of Public Health and Environment. This was done to us by force, all under the guise of a health emergency. Well, we have examined the evidence for the so-called pandemic and assert the following. The death count is misleading and substantially overstated. Testing for COVID-19 has huge flaws. The cure is worse than the disease. The public has been severely misled and masks and social distancing will not stop the spread of the virus. Furthermore, COVID-19 is no worse than a seasonal flu. Our conclusion, there is no emergency. Therefore, we, the citizens of Colorado, have decided for ourselves, we do not comply. We do not comply with unconstitutional orders that are not even laws. We do not comply with unscientific emergency orders using manipulated data to target our livelihoods. We do not comply with the use of fear tactics and manipulation to coerce us into our homes. We do not comply with the wearing of face coverings that do not stop the spread of infection and hide our faces and block our voices from being heard. Instead, we declare we are citizens in charge. We declare ourselves free, free to educate our children as we see fit. Free to see yeah, our much. friends and family members at the time of our choosing. Okay, you cut her off. Thank you. All right. Next caller. And by the way, and, and just to just to reiterate, um, I, I, everyone gets three minutes. You know, sorry. And our last caller, your phone number ends in nine two six nine two six. There you are. Can you hear me? Hello, good evening. Um, thank you, Mayor Bagley and uh, council members. Um, I am calling today um, to mention the fact that the uh, Wall Street Journal is just publishing an article Sir? about how the, yeah? May you please state your name for the record and address. Thank you. Okay, sorry. Uh, it's Ben Sargent and uh, I live on Atwood Street in uh, East Side. <clears throat> thank you. Okay, so Wall Street Journal article, um, the big tech giant Cisco Systems um, is now dropping out of the smart city technology market uh, after investing heavily in the, in the initiative over the last uh, decade or so. So why did that happen? Because they recognize that people don't want it. Cities don't want to be smart city surveilled <laughs> because of the all of the um, uh, publicity around surveillance technology, basically. And uh, Google also shut down this model project in Toronto for the same reason. No one in the community wanted it. Um, it was bad for their brand. So um, I, I'm calling because I, I understand that the city is trying to move ahead with putting smart meters on all of the 
houses and uh, apartments here. And um, I suspect that the real reason that it's being rolled out is, again, for surveillance, uh, because if the only intention really was the balancing and regulating of power needs across the city, um, if that was the only goal, Longmont could achieve that with approximately 406 smart meters, maybe a few more, maybe a few less, depending on how you, um, how, how evenly distributed they are. Uh, but it's completely unnecessary to put smart meters on every house. Um, so the only justification for imposing smart cities, meters on all of the homeowners and all of the uh, rental property owners is um, that the data collection has monetary value, um, and that's why mo you know the 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 um, cities want it. Obviously, uh, they can monetize it, but um, that's why the people don't want it. And so the the cities that are listening to their people are are um, actually stepping back from the whole smart technology, uh, smart city uh, push. And I hope that Longmont will wake up before it's too late. This is a gross misuse of public funds um, to do this entire project. It's completely unnecessary. Um, there's no justification for it. And um, uh, if you want to regulate the, the usage of power in the city, uh, you yeah, sampling I, I, is I all you need. I hate to cut you off, but that's three minutes. Thank you very much. We appreciate it. And Mayor, that was the last caller. Um, all right. I heard a cat meow from somebody. But anyway, let's go ahead and move on to the consent agenda and reading, or the consent agenda and introduction, introduction and reading by the title of first reading of ordinances. Don, you're muted, it sounds like. Thank you. Mayor, item 9A is resolution 2021-01, a resolution of the Longmont City Council approving the intergovernmental agreement between the city and the regional transportation district for EcoPass contract. 9B is resolution 2021-02, a resolution of the Longmont City Council approving the intergovernmental agreement between the city and Boulder County for parent education services. 9C is resolution 2021-03, a resolution of the Longmont City Council modifying the method of appointment of the commissioners of the Longmont Housing Authority. And 9D is designate the city's website as the official posting location for city council meeting notices for 2021 meetings. Councilmember Martin. I move the consent agenda. Second. Second. All right, the consent agenda has been moved and seconded. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, say nay. All right, the consent agenda passes unanimously. Let's move on to items from, or actually just general business. I'm gonna move that we recess the Longmont City Council and convene as the Board of Commissioners of the Longmont Housing Authority. Second. Second. It's been moved by me and seconded by Councilmember Christensen. All in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed, say nay. All right, uh, the motion passes unanimously. We have a motion to adopt the revised LHA bylaws that are consistent with the Longmont City Council. As the LHA Board of Commissioners establish the Longmont Housing Authority Advisory Board and take specific actions called for in the bylaws. So moved. Second. Second. All right, it's been moved by Councilmember Martin and seconded by Councilmember Peck. Anybody have any questions, comments, or concerns? Seeing none, let's vote. All in favor say oh, aye. Oh, 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 oh. oh, oh sorry, sorry, I saw you, I saw you at the bottom. All right, Dr. Waters. Thank you, Mayor Bagley. I, my question really is not as much about this motion. I'm gonna vote for this motion, um, but we it didn't seem the, the right time to weigh in as we were approving the uh, consent agenda and I didn't wanna pull, pull, pull an item off. Is there a provision on tonight's agenda to appoint the, the, the immediate past, I guess, now, uh, LHA board members minus me uh, to the advisory board. Are we? Is that on the agenda? Are we doing that tonight? If not, I, at some point we should. Just I'll, I'll, I'll just say that and be quiet and vote for this motion. Um, 
So there's some pieces in this. So um, point one, adopt the revised bylaws that recognizes the city council as a LHA board of commissioners and it establishes the Longmont Housing Authority Advisory Board. The second piece is appoint the former members of the LHA board as members of the newly created Housing Advisory Board. The other piece is if council chooses to appoint me as the interim executive director of the Housing Authority. So that's the adoption piece. Or, so Harold, just let me interrupt. If, so if we, uh, if we pass the bylaws, then we've taken care of the appointment issue of the advisory board. Thank you. Across the board and for the executive director too. All right, did anybody else have any questions? All right, it's been moved and seconded that we adopt the revised LHA bylaws and, and the rest of 12A. Uh, the motion's on the table, it's been seconded. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, say nay. All right, the ayes carry it unanimously. Um, do we have a motion to adjourn as the Board of Commissioners of the Longmont Housing Authority and reconvene as the Longmont City Council? Councilmember So Peck. moved. Second. Oh, Councilmember Peck, you got sniped. Oh, man. Oh, God, that was brutal. Councilmember Christensen made the motion. It was seconded by Dr. Waters. They All swooped in. in. <laughs> I just swooped in. All in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed, say nay. All right, the motion carries unanimously. Let's move on to 12B, possible changes to inclusionary housing code for review and direction. Harold? That's actually gonna be Kathy. Good evening, Mayor and Council. Kathy Fiddler, Housing and Community Investment Division Manager. Um, and tonight I would also like to ask um, Molly and Heidi to uh, turn on their video and unmute themselves in case there are things that they need to answer. Um, Heidi Peterson is our inclusionary housing program specialist. Um, and she, um, and then Molly McElroy is our housing program specialist. And Heidi takes the development side of the inclusionary housing program um, through the provision of units, working with the developers, attends the DRC meetings, tracks the projects, um, collects the fee in lieu when we get that and approves middle tier housing when we get that. And then Molly works on the home buyer side once we have housing units, um, gets down payment assistance as needed, processes fee waivers and other financial support through the CDBG um, and affordable housing um, funds. So both of those folks are integral parts of this um, and have um, been involved in the inclusionary housing um, since the beginning in the case of Molly and um, as soon as she was hired in the case of Heidi and work together to um, um, make sure that we always have somebody who's knowledgeable about the inclusionary housing program as we, as we move forward. So what we're bringing forth to you tonight is um, some updates that we have um, observed over the, the course of the two years that the program has been in operation, all of 2019 and all of 2020. Um, since the ordinance was passed and approved effective December 24th of 2018. Um, you remember it's a citywide and a countywide goal of 12% of the housing deed restricted as permanent and affordable is our goal. Um, there's many options for compliance with the ordinance um, and accessory dwelling units and individual single family homes are exempted. Um, you wanna bring up the PowerPoint please? and go to the third page. All right, there. Okay, so like I said, in the two years following the adoption, we've identified some areas. Some of these were identified by planning staff um, and some by um, us just going through the, the processes. Um, so this is a review of some specific areas where there's either been conflicts um, between the language and the code and possible intent. Sometimes council has actually brought up issues um, as we have, as you have reviewed some of the voluntary um, agreements, et cetera. So we're providing options for resolving these scenarios um, that has ar have arisen for your input. Um, items one through nine 
our possible um, potential amendments to the code. And then we have two areas at the end, items number 10 and 11, that we just want to bring forward and get your initial thoughts on them, any further input from the community, how you want us to get that kind of thing. So those will be coming back um, for further discussion for sure. Next slide, please. So the first one is an exemption for existing housing units. So um, the current code does not provide for an exemption for existing housing units that would remain as part of a new project. Um, if you remember the Martin Street family, multifamily project, council um, did approve a motion to give the developer an exemption for the pre-existing unit that was going to remain and be included as part of the, the project on site. It was the original house um, and they were going to rehab it and rent it as part of the, the project. There was also another um, um, home on the site that they demolished, so they did not get an exemption for that. So based on council's previous direction, the question is, should the code be um, language be amended to reflect an exemption from the inclusionary housing calculation for existing housing units that would remain on site? So option one is to change the code to provide the exemption for existing and remaining part of the project housing units or to leave the code as is and deal with those on a case by case basis. And if you wanna provide direction as we go through this, that might be the easiest. Um, and I can answer questions about each one as well. I suggest that if we, we do take motions, we'll have to exit in and out of the presentation for the mayor to be able to accurately see. You, you broke up real quick. Can you say it one more time, Mayor Pro Tem? I was just saying, if we're going to take motions after each uh, bullet point or item that we should probably exit in and out of the presentation so you can accurately see who wants to ask questions and such. That's true. I just noticed that Heidi Peterson, Kathy Fedler, and Polly Christensen and yourself currently do not have any hands raised. I don't see anybody else. But what I would like to do is how many, how many, how many slides do we have? Is it possible to go through it and then return and then do that all at once? Yeah, there's, there's 20 total, or we could stop at the nine and go back and do those and then have the discussion on nine, uh, 10 and 11. What do, what do you think is best? You know what's coming, Kathy. What, what, what would you recommend we do? I think it would probably be most quickest and most helpful probably to just take each one as it is. Take the questions on each one and do on each one. Let's do that. Yeah. And then let's go back. Right now. I, can, I can see everybody right now. So you put up the slide real quick. Oh, perfect. Um, so we're looking at option one, the cha change the code to provide an exemption for existing and remaining housing units or two, leave the code as is and deal with it on a case by case basis. Okay, council member Christensen. Sorry, um, we're making a decision uh, on inclusionary housing at a time that is uh, kind of a financial meltdown. So, um, I, first of all, Kathy, thank you for all the hard work you've done on these. These are things that we need to deal with. So, um, and I think we can go through them pretty quickly and uh, get it out of the way. This particular one has to do with uh, already built housing that will have stuff added on. I think each one of these cases will be very different. I would rather not try to do a <clears throat> one size fits all and I would like to see us leave this as it is on a case by case basis for a while and maybe re-examine it after the economy picks up a little bit. Um, I think that because these are going to be uh, odd cases, we should look at them on a case-by-case -case basis. So I would recommend that we, I would move that we suggest, you're not looking for motions, right? Yeah, we need to, we need to pass motions oh, to give direction. Okay. So I assume, okay, I would, I would move that we uh, go for option two and leave it as is for now. Second. All right, it's been moved and seconded. Anyone disagree with that? All right, all in favor of the motion, which is just to leave it as is, say aye. 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 
Opposed, say nay. By nay. The motion Thank you, Joan Peck. Councilman well, Peck, chime in. Can I make a statement <laughs> here for a minute? Yeah, sure, go ahead. Uh -huh. um, I don't, are we voting on each one of these or are we just going to tell each one of us what option we prefer? Well, we're going to, we're going, well, if there's a motion, you okay. know, and, and there's okay. a second, we will vote on it. All right. If, I mean, just, just. All right. I just missed, I just missed um, the strategy here. So thank you. Okay, that's all right. So um, to be clear, it was a six to one with six eyes and one nay with council member Peck dissented, right? Okay, let's keep going, Kathy. Can you put up the slide again then, please? And go to the next one. All right, so on group homes, um, right now there's the code does not provide for a, an exemption for additional units added within the current existing building footprint and or conversion of non-living space to living areas or bedrooms. So in this example, we did have a group care home conversion um, provided, uh, application was submitted and then later withdrawn, but the pro, uh, what happened was the proposal was converting a single family home of three bedrooms into a group care home and converting the garage area and some former non-living and living areas into um, five additional bedrooms for a total of eight. The code currently requires all the square footage to be considered in the inclusionary housing calculation. So similar to the one before this, option one is to amend the code for group home conversions to exclude existing bedroom spaces from the inclusionary housing square footage calculation and only new bedroom spaces would be applicable. Or two, we could exclude group homes from the inclusionary housing code requirement altogether. I guess the third one would be just to leave it as is. <laughs> Councilmember Martin. Um, thank you, Mayor Bagley. Um, Kathy, you, are group homes typically not for profit organizations or can they be for profit? They could be either one. This particular one, I believe, is for profit. Okay. That makes it more complicated in my mind, but I want to listen to other people first before making any motion. Councilmember Waters. Well, just to get it on the floor, I'm not gonna, I won't argue one side of this or the other. I'm gonna, I'm gonna move that we, uh, we approve option number one, which is to exclude existing bedrooms, but any additional or new bedrooms are subject to the code. Second. <laughs> All right, it's been moved and seconded. Councilmember Christensen. Okay. All in favor say aye. Aye. Oh, sorry, aye. hold on, hold on, I'm sorry, sorry. I thought, I think I, 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 I Councilor Mayor Christensen, you wanted to talk and then you moved it like, go on, go on, and then you waved it again. Do you want to say something? Okay, I'll briefly say something. I'm in support of what Councilman Waters uh, suggested. Um, does the language specifically say group care home? It needs to say group care home because a group, just a group living together would be a totally different thing. We'll, we'll make sure that it matches the planning definition. Okay, okay. Yeah, I do think we should, um, I don't think we should exclude them because as Councilman Martin pointed out, there's a big difference between a uh, for-profit and a not-for-profit, sometimes not, but um, anyway, I, I, I would support option one. Okay, there's a motion on the table to uh, adopt or instruct staff to adopt uh, number one, option one. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed say nay. Nay. All right. The motion, uh, the motion carries six to one with uh, Mayor Pro Tem Rodriguez in the dissent. Thank you. All right. Um, and uh, just for future reference, we don't, we're not going to do it now, but anytime, uh, Mayor Pro Tem, anytime you've got a, an opinion, um, I'd love to hear the reason behind it. And I, I don't mean that to argue. I mean that with all sincerity. I did raise my hand. You just didn't catch it. Oh, then let's, you know what, then point of order. Uh, that's my fault. Let's go back and actually we'll re-vote. I mean, if you don't mind, I'm sorry. Uh, I think the vote is fine to stand. Okay. 
but I'd course. be happy to explain real quick. Go, go ahead, please. Is that I, I feel that the affordable housing program, uh, at least in this case, is going more by the letter of the law than the spirit of the law, in my opinion, because uh, when I think uh, of trying to provide said housing for the, the community at large, group homes don't necessarily come into my mind as something of working class folks trying to find a place to live, much less anybody trying to look for uh, ownership of a property or rental of a full property. This is, seems, to be to, seems to me to be a completely separate issue in the sense that these are, these are folks who are, are needing some sort of assisted living in concept. And so I don't think it really is a detriment to our housing stock. Uh, just an opinion, but that's why I voted nay. I would have preferred option two to exclude all group homes from the affordable housing program. Councilmember Martin. Although, although just, just to be clear, before we start talking, the motion, the motion's passed. Right. And it's so, passed. yes, it's passed. So I just didn't call on Mayor Pro Tem. And if you wanted to take the vote again, I would have asked us to go ahead and do that because I did not, he's at the, on my screen, he's at the very, very bottom. And so um, uh, for some reason, I'm, I'm not, I'm not saying Dr. Waters, I missed one from Dr. Waters, missed one from yeah. Aaron. I'll just start and, voguing uh, next. Yeah, exactly. Just if you move, I, I catch it. So I, I apologize. So, all right. So thank you. Thank you, Mayor Pro Tem. So that motion is passed and carried uh, six to one with Mayor Pro Tem Rodriguez in the dissent. All right. Uh, so no, because I had a hand up and was called on. And oh, oh, no, go ahead, Councilor Mayor Martin. Um, now, it, well, I wanted to comment because I'm not sure we shouldn't vote again. Um, that was the reason I asked the profit nonprofit question was because these are institutions; these are not housing. Um, uh, we don't. We don't. We don't need to vote again. You know, Mayor Pro Tem is the only dissenting vote and he did not object. So Council Member Christensen. I, I see what um, both points that you're making. However, this specifically talks about when you're converting a home into a group home. So it is actually affecting our housing stock. Um, and it, particularly if it's a, a, a for-profit, very high income stuff. Okay. Anyway. So again, again, we've taken the vote. So all this is 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 is, uh, is politely, you know, all all obsolete. So let's go ahead and move on with the presentation and go on to the next uh, hotly debated topic. And can you go to the next slide, please, number six? So single family home conversion to a duplex. We've had several residents have brought proposals to the DRC to convert existing homes into duplex homes where allowed by existing zoning. Proposals have not included a change to the existing footprint of the residents of what we've seen so far. Option one is to keep the existing language in the code, which is a conversion from a single family home into a duplex is subject to inclusionary housing requirements and one of the two units would need to meet the inclusionary housing requirement. Option two would be to exclude single family conversion to a duplex from the inclusionary housing code, similar to the exemption for ADUs. Or option three would be to apply the inclusionary housing only when adding more than one unit, so converting it to a triplex or a multiplex. Um, those are the three options that we have uh, are proposing. And two and three kind of go together by exempting a duplex, but if it was more than one unit added. Let's go with Mayor Pro Tem Rodriguez. The bottom of the screen, but yeah. hand is up. <laughs> Uh, uh, thank you, Mayor Bagley. This is just a question about the, the difference between option two and three in the sense that let's say you had a triplex and you wanted to convert it to a fourplex or a fourplex to a fiveplex or say just adding one unit, does, does that then apply in option three to any size complex that just wants to add one unit per se? Just curious. I guess you you provide direction to me. What would okay. <laughs> What would make sense in, in that situation if you're just adding one sure. unit, no matter what the size, should it apply or does it have to be more than one? Okay, 
Well, I mean, there's there's obviously certain limitations based on square footage as well as zoning uh, of such things. I would be okay personally, and I'll move option two uh, specifically for single family conversion to duplexes. I will second that, which would make it exempt, correct? Correct. Councilmember, uh, Councilmember Waters' hands up, but I noticed Councilmember Peck, you had a hand up and you have not said as much as others. So do you want to say something? Yes, thank you, Mayor Bagley. So um, my confusion comes in if someone wants to have a triplex or a fourplex, then are they excluded as well? Or is only the duplex excluded? And that, I'm not sure that is clear to me. If we go with option two, does option three stand as uh, being included in the inclusionary housing? I guess this is for Kathy. Yeah, I mean, I would say yes, unless you're telling me that if you're only adding one unit, one additional unit, that it doesn't apply. Otherwise, I would say if you vote on number two, number three is assumed. See that I was going to move option three because that automatically took out the duplex. But if we just vote for option two, then I'm not sure if we have a solid reason for option three to include inclusionary housing. That's a gray area for me. Councilmember Martin, because your fingers move faster than Councilmember Christensen. Oh, point oh. of order. Councilmember Christensen. No, just kidding. Councilmember Martin, go ahead. So I actually have, uh, I, I think, a solution um, that, first of all, we can use, we could have two motions, right? We have more than one option that could be implemented independently. Um, so I would like to, I'll tell you in advance what my two motions are. Um, I think I would move, uh, or I guess we should vote on council member Rodriguez's, uh, motion, which is to exclude duplexes, right? Exclude a single family home being split into a duplex and it's exempt. So we should vote on that. And then after that, I would like to um, vote on the, the um, adding one unit to an NPLEX um, and exempt that as well. Um, so I'll move that after we're done voting on the first time. And the reason that I, and, and the, anything that's different from that would have to be handled as a separate case, you know, as a special case, but that would be, seem, seems like it'd be pretty rare. And the reason that I, think of it he, he, this way is because these ex exclusive, these are adding density, which is what we want. So let's be lenient about it and encourage adding density. So, they're gonna go down in, in price anyway, because they're smaller. So Mayor, Mayor Potem, would you accept the friendly amendment from the second that basically just says that we will exempt um, anyone adding a plus one meaning if you have a single home going to a duplex or duplex to a triplex or a triplex to add on one more, that it would be exempt? Yeah, and just to make it a little bit more complicated, I would accept the amendment as long as it doesn't um, exceed zoning limits. Yeah, absolutely. So the motion is that um, any, anyone adding on one more, one more unit um, to an existing unit, as long as it's one more and does not ex uh, extend or, or go beyond the zoning, what is permitted by the zoning limits. Um, that, is, that, that is the motion in the second. Um, but we have plenty of questions, comments, concerns, and debate left. Council Member Christensen, then Council Member Waters. Uh, okay, I, I'm all for adding density in the right places. The right places are downtown and some of the other areas where we already have apartments and things like that. When you start adding more and more and more density to a neighborhood, what you take away is your neighbor's right to any kind of sunshine in their backyard, your neighbor's right to any kind of privacy, your neighbor's right to any kind of peace and quiet and having the, the neighborhood that they moved into. 
I think we can do that in a smart way by just limiting things as we did with ADUs and STRs to not that many per neighborhood. But once we start just saying, do what you want, you know, <laughs> and, and it doesn't have to be affordable, you can just keep adding and keep adding and keep adding because I have lived in big cities and this is what happens. It creeps along until everybody's filled up every available piece of space. And that kind of undermines our uh, carbon sequestration and the ability for the ground to absorb things. It messes up drainage, it messes up, it stresses out sewer systems, it stresses out parking, it stresses out everything. So I really think we need to be careful about doing this. I think it's fine for people to, to do this, but I want them to be making it affordable instead of just doubling their income and monetizing their neighborhood, turning their neighborhood basically into a commercial district. So I would, I'm not gonna vote for this unless it's option one. Okay, Dr. Waters. Thanks, I see Harold uh, wanting to get in. I, I, I'll, I'll come in behind Harold. Yeah, I don't know, yeah. Uh, Harold, you're at the bottom of my screen. Sorry, buddy. I have That's a, fine. For some reason, fine. my, uh, just, these are bifocals and they're, <laughs> they're uh, for whatever it's worth, they're, they're uh, progressive lenses. And so um, I, if I'm like this, I see the top three rows, but I don't see Mayor Pro Tem or Harold. So unless there's movement, I'm like a dinosaur, I'm a T-Rex. If there's no movement, uh, you gotta wave that hand. All right, Dr. Waters, sorry, Harold, let's go with you, then Dr. Waters. Yeah, the only thing I wanted to clarify, so <clears throat> you've got two different issues here. You have one allowing the one additional, and then you have a zoning issue. And so even if you could allow the one additional, that doesn't override the zoning if you can't have that many units in that area. So the zoning's always going to regulate how many units you can have. This is simply saying, if you could have additional units by zoning, how do you wanna do this? So I wanted to kind of pull those two things apart for each, from each other. Do I have the floor? Yes, you do. Yeah, thanks. So I just would like some clarification on exactly what the motion is. I think of what I heard is that if you are gonna build an ADU, that's not subject to the, to the ordinance, but if you're gonna build a duplex, it is. We're expanding. Talking, we're talking about going from one dwelling unit to two, meaning taking a single family home to a duplex. Or a duplex to a triplex, a triplex so, but to so, a so I'm So you're, I'm accurate. The motion is, if you're going to go from a single family home to a duplex, it, the, the motion is that it's subject to the ordinance. No, it's exempt. Okay, so let's Why just clarify. An ADU or a, a, a single home to a duplex would be exempt. A triplex, the third unit would be subject to the ordinance. No. Yeah, anything about... No, just, that, that's all I need to know. I'm going to vote against the motion. Thank uh, you. Okay. okay. <laughs> council member uh, Idago Faring. I, I see your hand, Marsha, but uh, council member Idago Faring hasn't said anything tonight. So I'm just, you were up first, but I'm just trying to give everybody voice. Um, yeah, I'm trying to wrap my head around this one because, it, okay, so if you had it, uh, an existing home, is it talking about expanding it, so using up yard space, or is it just converting the existing space into two parts? Or so, like, so right, I think the, about the, where we used to live on Bowen Street, people had converted their houses, like the top part was the house, and then the, the basement or um, was the additional duplex, so it wasn't expanding space, and would this in, differentiate that. So, so this the motion is only pertaining to whether or not the the, the expansion is exempt to for, to the to the uh, uh, what do we call this the uh, 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 it's getting late. What's the words that we use? The inclusionary housing yes. uh, code. It does not. It does not change zoning. It doesn't change zoning. It doesn't say they can do it automatically. It just says if they do get permission, if there is a, if there is a, a, a if they want to do it, do they have to pay into the inclusionary zoning fund? 
or are they exempt? But as far as whether or not they're permitted, the size, the variances, that all still stays the same. The motion does not that, touch on that, guess, only if yeah, they're guess, exempt. That, that would kind of change my mind though, because if they're utilizing the space in their yard to add another an additional unit, I, I, I would go with option one. If it's just taking your same house and not expanding, I, yeah, well, I see you, what you're saying. Yeah, so what you're, you're saying that you say you're viewing a difference between going from one house contained to two yes. units two. versus one house to an yeah. ADU. Yes. You view a difference. Yes, and, I and, do. And, so uh, ADUs are already exempted under the code, and we're not proposing that that be changed. Okay. So a couple of examples that we've had. So one. Uh, homeowner came to us and they wanted to put two units in the basement and one unit upstairs. So mm -hmm. they're going from a single family home to two, right. three, four, a, a, a quadplex basically. So in that instance, they didn't change the footprint. So this could be either adding units within the existing footprint or they could have add, added on and used up yard space. Um, so either one could apply on this. ADUs would be exempt. And my understanding is what the amendment was that one additional unit could be added and be exempt. But if it was two or more existing footprint or new add-on, that would be subject to the inclusionary housing and ADUs stay exempt. Okay. And there's a very clear okay. definition around what's an ADU. Okay, so if we pass the option two, then that is only the addition of one more unit. So if we go for two to three, then it is subject to the uh, inclusionary housing. If okay. they went already had two units and went to three, that would just be adding one. So that would be yeah, that's what I mean. under yeah. the amendment. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Is my understanding, Mark? Uh, Councilmember yeah, Martin, you might have a, a better explanation since it was your amendment. Well, council, it sort of council was. Member, council Member Martin. Thank you. The mayor changed my proposal. I was proposing to handle it as two motions. Um, and I think we'd be done by now if we'd done it that way because all these complexities are putting it in. So let's return to the Mayor Pro Tem's original mo uh, motion and vote just on whether you can divide an existing single family unit into a duplex and have it be exempt. And then what I would suggest instead of my, my preview of coming attractions was let's let Kathy move the two to three and the three to the four into number nine and 10 so that we can think about it more and not be here all night. Right, um, uh, but there is a motion on the floor that belongs to the Mayor Pro Tem. Mayor Pro Tem Rodriguez? So it, to a certain extent, it does sound like Council Member Martin has asked me or is retracting an amendment or I can not accept a friendly amendment that wasn't technically offered maybe. Um. <laughs> That's right, it wasn't <laughs> offered. It was gonna be a second amendment. A second I, I do, yeah, yeah, I, I understand that point. And you know, in that case, I will uh, reject the friendly amendment at this time. And I just would also like to say that um, in the concept of, of folks worrying a lot about this, when I said zoning uh, requirements, I also am very well cognizant of that each zoning district within our city has a density cap, okay? And so when we were talking about ADUs, we were talking about density caps, and I was suggesting at that time that we count ADUs towards said density cap, which would be essentially the same issue with converting single family to duplex or triplex or, or quadplex, it doesn't really matter. It, it adds density units to whatever that acreage unit is of say eight units per acre, which I believe is our current single family, residential single family requirement. And then up, so on and so forth as we go up from to residential multi-neighborhood or mixed neighborhood to residential uh, high density. And as, as we go along there, or multifamily, I mean, used to be high density, it's multifamily now. Anyway, the point being is that there are density caps and you're not going to uh, drastically change the character of a neighborhood because of these density caps. 
And so I don't want there to be some sort of huge fear out there that all of a sudden you're in a single family neighborhood and there's an additional 16 units. It's just not gonna happen on your block. That's my point, so, but I'm happy to go with uh, the motion I originally made. All right, so uh, Councilmember Waters. Yeah, just I, I should have asked the question when I before I signed off. Um, what what in your what's the rationale for you or the mayor pro tem in exempting an ADU from the ordinance, but requiring a duplex, adding a second unit as a duplex to be subject to the ordinance? It's not in both the cases. You're it's the exact opposite. The ADU is exempt already. I know it is. The motion. And the exemption is saying, this is exempt. Well, that's the question I asked and I had heads go and no, and I had an explanation. No, no, they, the, the, the motion is that if you've got a unit and you're, you're adding one, two to, or one to two, two to three, three to four, four to five, um, that new unit will be exempt, just like an ADU. Then I'm going to vote for the money. That's okay. that's what that's what I want to clarify. <laughs> right. I just as long as we're not treating the yes, adding no, a duplex one way and an ADU another way, no, it's, it's like it's, it, we're we're treating an additional unit in the same one unit, no unit. matter what. The it's one exempt. additional unit is exempt. Thank Correct. you. Correct. Yes. I'll that vote for the motion. All right, Councilmember Christensen. <laughs> Councilmember Peck's loving this. Welcome to 2021. Councilmember Christensen, floor is yours. In the example that Kathy gave, that same homeowner could create one unit a year and all of them would eventually be exempt because he'd be creating one after another, after another, after another. Or would that, how would that play out? Your house Kathy. would be very small. Also density caps. So, in, in my opinion, on that question, we would be tracking and we would know if they were adding one a year and one exemption would be the, I, we'd have to add that into the, the language. So that would be one in total per, per property. Yeah, okay. All right, so Harold, sorry, you're at the bottom. Yeah, I just want I just want to reiterate again in case people are watching and and so so here's the point. Somebody can come into Kathy and go, I want to convert this house into a duplex. Kathy, Heidi, or Molly. I want to convert this into a duplex. At the end of the day, they may be able to do it via the affordable housing ordinance. But if zoning says they can't, they can't do it. And so I want to just make that clear. So to your point, there's two checks to this is what Councilmember Rodriguez or Mayor Pro Tem said. There's actually two checks, A, Kathy, B, zoning, um, because you can't allow that growth to go. And, and so zoning's always going to overrule on the affordable housing ordinance. Yeah, zoning's the first check. We just come in afterwards and apply it as affordable housing, not, we're, we're not approving plans. It's just how the inclusionary housing is, is applied. Correct. Not changing any variance codes, et cetera, other than are we going to make them pay into the inclusionary zoning fund? Council member Lago Ferry. So this is just, I just want a clarification for people who are listening as well. So if we pass the option two um, to exclude the single family conversion to a duplex from in, um, inclusionary housing, it's not going to create a system of development gone out of control um, where our neighborhoods are going to have this influx of because of the zoning component that's going to put a cap on that so I just you know I just wanted to have that clarification um, as we move forward so primarily for people listening okay so, ahead, so can I ask a point of clarification so as I've heard this discussion are we really talking about option three as opposed to option two, where we are applying inclusionary housing only when more than one unit is added? Not specifically just single family to a duplex. I, I thought I heard discussion around if it was a triplex to a quadplex or 
a duplex to a triplex, adding one more unit is allowed, but anything above that, regardless of where you started out, would be exempt or would not be exempt. So just, that's just a point of clarification. Are we really, is it really number three? Um, I would draw my motion and subsequently move option three. Can you put, can you put second, option, second, <laughs> can you put option three back up? So that is option three. Yes. All right. Okay. Well, so who was the, who was the person who said we should take down the slides while we're discussing this? <laughs> Mayor Bagley can see all the hands. Me. Me. Mayor Pro Tem, well done. Well, well, well played, my friend. That was funny. We just got punked by the Mayor Pro Tem. I'll second that. So it's been moved and seconded that we go with option three. All in favor say aye. 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 Oppo oppose say nay. Nay. All right. The motion carries six to one with Council Member Christensen in the dissent. Uh, new, we discovered a new way to count to three, people. I think that's, that's, that's great. Typical government in action. <laughs> All right. Let's keep right, going through the slides. Slide. <clears throat> okay. One of the situations that came up was a property line adjustment. This proposal um, was to move the property line between two lots so that an existing driveway would be located completely on the lot of the homeowner. Um, typically, a lot line would not have um, triggered affordable housing or any kind of a, a review, um, but because this was complicated due to the driveway location, a replat was required, which does trigger um, the process to go through inclusionary housing. So the question is, do we want to maintain the language in the inclusionary housing code and continue to have minor lot line adjustments subject to IH if there's a replat that's needed um, and deal with those issues on a case by case basis? Or do we want to amend the code to exclude this specific type of replat? Take the slide down, please. All right. So that said, um, do we have a, a Mayor Pro Tem? There you go, Aaron's <laughs> got it. So it, if it truly is that specific, I, I'm okay with the exemption on that. I mean, but that's extremely specific. And so I'm just curious what you would consider other examples of that beside that specific example. Otherwise I'd be more than happy to move uh, option two, I believe. Is that a motion? I just want to answer the question first before I make that motion. So Heidi, do you have any background on this? This was a very specific one and I don't know, um, and Joni, I don't know if she's still on or not, if she has anything to, to jump in or, as well on what other kind of anomalies we might see, but this was a very specific one that, that did come up um, and I don't know that we've seen any other weird ones like this yet. <laughs> not that it, couldn't come up. Uh, Mayor Begley and Mayor Pro Tem. Um, so yeah, I think lot line adjustments, in my professional opinion, certainly wouldn't meet the threshold of um, necessitating an inclusionary housing ad. However, I think the way the original ordinance was written, there wasn't a clear cut way for someone to exclude them. So I think this is certainly an anomaly. Well, I think if they're replatting in order to, or changing a lot line in order to have a developable lot, that's quite different mm -hmm. than, than this particular instance as well. Right, I see how changing lot lines could uh, necessitate uh, falling into the IH. Uh, one thing I, I also had a question on, but uh, this could be answered later possibly, but I'm gonna throw it out there now, is that it seemed like a lot of the communication in our council comm was that specific things were hitting a certain level of uh, review in the development process that were throwing them into the IH category. Uh, and so that becomes some of my question because the specific example cited obviously doesn't make uh, an exemption uh, or it does make exemption status to me. But as somebody pointed out hypothetically, you could totally re redraw a lot line that would add enough space to 
uh, build an additional unit as we were just talking about. And so, uh, so I guess because of what uh, Assistant City Manager Marsh just said, I'd rather do this one on a case by case as far as redrawing lot lines. Um, so I guess I move option one based on hypotheticals alone. Uh, the specific, the specificity of the example given, though, I would have advocated for an exemption. So I think this one seems a little up in the air. I'll second that. <laughs> Councilmember Martin, your fingers, again, we're moving fast. Then we'll go with Councilmember Christensen. Well, I, I don't have a comment because of the direction that the mayor pro tem went, so. All right, well, well your fingers were still moving fast. Councilmember Christensen. Uh, yeah, I would support what um, Mayor Pro Tem Rodriguez said. I, I think that this is, it, it is very weird. I mean, we don't want to make development and renovation impossible. We, but we also don't want, you know, I just think it's a, better to review this on a case-by-case -case basis since it's a, kind of a strange little anomaly. Dr. Waters. Uh, thanks, Mayor Bagley. Kathy, is it is this like the is this like the one exception that's come along? If, so if that's the case, I'm 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 comfortable with with the motion. Uh, but I, but I do have a question. How often? How much staff time is spent reviewing the exceptions that you could uh, you could reduce staff time if you if you just change the ordinance to exclude the kinds of the kinds of uh, replatting you're talking about? Well, I, I don't remember exactly how much time we spent on this. We did have dis multiple discussions with planning staff and with the city attorney's office around this one and what to do about it. Um, some might be easier than others to, to move forward on. Um, I don't think it's an, an inordinate amount of time. Um, and I think we resolved it, if I remember right, internally. Heidi, correct me if I'm wrong, and, and it didn't come to council. Uh, for a resolution that we all fairly agreed that this really wouldn't um, trigger inclusionary housing because of what happened. Um, so I think dealing or leaving it on a case by case basis until we get more data would be perfectly fine. Okay. We need a second. Right. We've got a motion for number. No, I seconded it. So. I, we have a we have a motion on the table by Mayor Pro Tem, which I seconded for option one, which basically is taken on a case by case basis. All in, Harold, you look like you're confused. Okay, all right. All in favors? All right. Eugene, all job, Eugene, Eugene. Eugene. Where you? go ahead. Yep, go ahead, Eugene. Uh, Mayor and Council, there 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 is really no case by case basis. It either does or doesn't trigger inclusionary housing, and so if you leave it as it is, it will trigger. I think. The staff, if I recall correctly, said we would let this one go and fix it in the code. So if you leave it in, it does trigger inclusionary housing. Then you get into an E6 circumstance where it has to meet the criteria of it creates more affordable housing and we, and we get kind of stuck. So the case by case basis, I think, is not an accurate representation. Replats trigger inclusionary housing now. And a property line adjustment is a replat. All right. So, Marsha, I see you. Hold on one second. It's going to be Marsha, then Polly, as soon as we finish. Mayor Pro Tem, uh, hearing that, what do you want to do with your motion? Well, now I have a question. Uh, in the in the concept of leaving it as is versus completely exempting. If we completely exempt, will we have some sort of recourse in the concept that somebody does adjust lot line or replat uh, to add additional units without triggering the the code? The affordable I, housing. I think if we, so basically it's not a case by case basis. What we're saying is that we're going to keep it in the code. We're going to include them in the inclusionary housing uh, uh, 
uh, fund. And if we choose later on to make an exemption, then we'll do that. Well, that was my question. Is there is there recourse for the specific uh, example cited as far as just moving a lot line for a driveway uh, so we can allow an exemption to happen even though there's no case by case basis to make said exemption? That's my question. It's happened once, right? So uh, we'll go with Harold. And go Joni first and then I'll go after Joni. Okay, Joni. Um, Mayor Bagley, members of council, it might be important to understand that the code for a lot line adjustment limits that lot line adjustment to no more than 10 feet. So it's a pretty succinct um, and basically it, you can only affect two adjacent lots. So the, the zoning code is really specific about a lot line adjustment. And so I would say in the 20 years I've been working in the planning department, I've probably done at least one of those a year and they have always been for something where perhaps a neighbor is, you know, giving someone five feet or they're moving something after the fact to accommodate utilities. So um, that's the typical standard for a lot line adjustment, if that helps. Mayor Potem, does that help? Uh, sh sure. Is there the ability as was pointed out earlier also by the assistant city manager to, or maybe it was by uh, the housing and community investment director, um, to say buy into a neighboring lot, to get the lot line adjusted to add more space for your development. Certainly, if 10 feet provides that, that would be a workaround, I guess, as you're indicating. Okay. I, I guess I just worry about dinging people for wanting to get their own driveway or, or what have you. But at the same time, I have an issue knowing that there's very creative people out there, which I'm not going to fault them for, but there's very creative people out there that can figure out some infill projects that could probably bypass us. And, you know, I guess at the end of the day, nothing's perfect. So I'm going to, I'm going to go with, I guess, uh, keeping the code as is. Okay. I'm going to second that because we just, one way or another, we need to motion. All right. Council member. Yeah, that was a motion. I'll second it. Councilmember Martin. So it seems to me that in the example given, it would, was impossible for the number of units total on the two pieces of property to change. And, and so isn't there some criterion that if the number of allowed units or existing units on after a replant plat doesn't change, then it shouldn't be retroactively sub uh, subjected to inclusionary housing. I mean, that would be a really terrible result. You know, if I'm sitting there with a, a triplex and, and I give a, uh, you know, move my lot line so that my neighbor's driveway is in his own yard, and suddenly I have to make an affordable unit out of my existing triplex. I mean, that's not a good result. Councilmember Christensen. Um, yeah, I was just wondering why, why it, it, if you're not going to build anything, why a lot line would trigger uh, in, an inclusionary housing thing that if somebody eventually decides to build something then uh, yeah I just don't I don't understand why that triggers a replat I think it's uh yes I'm sure that Harold will tell me <laughs> so I think the issue is um the letter of the law versus a practical application in this case and that's what the struggle is so under the zoning code, if you have to adjust the lot lines, you have to do a replat. 
even if that's adjusting it so you can build a driveway. So the practical application of this is they're adjusting the, the lot line to build a driveway. But because the way it's written is connected to the replat, it's what's putting that in the IH piece. And so that's at times, I think this is where Mayor Pro Tem was going at. And you're, tell, you're giving us direction today and we can think about this, but there's a point too where we give um, the admin, um, planning some discretion and, and maybe we look at it from the standpoint of if the replat is not going to create a condition for additional units to be developed, they have the ability, and again, we got to work the legal piece of this, where it's not beholden to the IH piece, because it really is a practical application versus the letter of the law, and that's what's catching this thing in this situation. So one solution maybe is give staff that discretion. One solution may be to give staff discretion if, if it's not going to create the scenario for additional housing units. That can be a staff level decision. Right. And, and then we'll figure out how to wordsmith it. Right. So, so basically, I am to restate the motion, uh, Mayor Pro Tem, I'm not hearing the motion to mean um, that it will be exempt so long as it does not create new housing units. Uh, my original motion was to leave the code as is, knowing that we can't do a case-by-case -case basis. So I'm not sure what the word smithing would be, because in concept, to me, that sounds like case-by-case, -case, but I'm not putting the words into, obviously, legal or staff's mouths on this one. That's just what it sounds like to me. Um, I'd be happy to change the motion if they can figure out how to thread that needle, but right now where I'm sitting at, there's not a needle to thread without any sort of wording for us to review. So that's why I'm sitting at leaving the code as is on this particular item. All right, so we have a motion to leave the code as is. Dr. Waters, go ahead and say what you have to say. Thanks, I'll, I'm gonna vote against leaving the code as is because it sounds to me like Harold just laid out option three, which is to come back with, with language that rather than try to wordsmith something at whatever time it is on tonight with another item on this agenda, um, that option three would be to come back with language that is more specific about the kinds of things that would be and would not be subjected to the code, which is where I think we ought to end up. But I, but I, but based on what I've heard, I'm not gonna vote to leave it as is. All right, so uh, I, uh, in any other night, any other night, I would let us go to 11 and not tell you guys and just end the meeting. But Sherry Malloy, I know, is really concerned about Left Hand Creek Park. And she was extremely nice to me and said some very nice things to me when I got divorced, when I was really needing some, 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 some support. So um, this is payback for just being a good citizen and treating your elected leaders just like humans. So I'm going to move that we extend the meeting uh, beyond the 11 o'clock limit. Second. Second. All right, it's been moved by myself and seconded by Councilmember Peck. All in favor say, oh, sorry, Councilmember Christensen. I think we're going to have a lot of discussion at the rest of this. I would move that we vote on this, uh, the property line adjustment, and then move on to the other, uh, the um, riparian area, because we have a lot of people who've spoken on it, and finish up um, number five through nine, uh, next week if possible, or have a special meeting. Would that, would, okay. Can we push it off till next week, Harold? Is that gonna be a problem? Or what we could do, what we could also do is let's, we could also uh, vote on this. Let's go ahead and address the Left Hand Creek Park riparian restoration. Then we can actually move to suspend the meeting and then just pick up, finish this, then go into our next week's meeting. You don't want us to do that, Harold? Or I'm sorry, you're on mute, Harold. You look beautiful talking, but we want to hear you. You're still, yep, you can do this, Harold. The mute button, hit the space bar, buddy. There you go. No, it's my, it's my mouse, it's my mouse. Um, 
we, we don't have anything on general business next week. If we have the items we need to add for you all, so that'll let us move it. So can we, so we could move, we'll just move this on. You don't need to continue it. This is just a, a, a study session item. There's a motion um, on the table. Aaron, do you, since it's coming back, theoretically, it's coming back next week. Mayor, so do you want to vote on the motion to extend the meeting first? All in favor of extending, Pardon say me. aye. 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 Oh, opposed, say nay. All right, motion carries unanimously. Thank you, Don. Um, it's your motion, Aaron, or Mayor Pro Tem. You can do whatever you want, but do we want Tim Hole and Eugene May to maybe provide some language that would provide some clarification? Hey, this one obviously has been slightly more tricky than some of the other questions, I think. Um, and as a, a real estate guy, I'm always happy to continue talking about real estate. So uh, I'm more than happy to continue the conversation. All right, so I'm going to move so I guess table. I'll withdraw my motion. Oh, cool. But I'm going to move that we table this conversation to next week. Second. Second. All, right, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed say nay. Right, nay. Harold, Harold and Tim, could you guys just put together some language that would address this that we can just vote on and you guys could like look smart and save the day and stuff? Okay. Thank you. All right. Let's go on to, did somebody else say something? I didn't see movement. Okay. Right, let's go on to the Left Hand Creek Park Riparian Restoration. Please. Hey, David. Hey, good evening, Mayor, Council Members. David Bell, Director of Parks and Natural Resources. Um, Appreciate you taking this forward because I do know this is important to a lot of members of the community as well as council. Um, I have a quick PowerPoint presentation to kind of set the stage for this. Um, with that being said, I, I think some of the stuff that I heard this evening, I can add some clarification that might make this easier for council and make this fairly quick as well. So um, again, this is really kind of that restoration of the creek area where we had the BMX track and the bike area made along the creek. Next slide, please. Again, just kind of putting in perspective where this, this park sits over there along Left Hand Creek, Left Hand Park. Next slide. It's really hard to see. John Fryer had written a story about this. We want to go and take a look at it. With the tree canopy, it's difficult to see from above. But as you get into the trees, these next slides will kind of show kind of the, the impact that was created down along the creek. Next slide. This area was always intended to be um, more of a, a natural area. Um, it did have one access area so people could walk down to the creek, but there was fencing, there was um, signage in place to try to make sure people understood that. Um, and uh, we, we definitely want to be looking at throughout any of these options, we look at how we enhance that signage. So next slide. This I'm going to use, this is a, a point to talk about um, some of the damage caused by the individual kids that I know were contacted by the paper and, and really were kind of focused at this event. If you look at this area, this is more than one or two kids working this area. And when we found out about this, this is a piece where I think the city needs to look at our process too, that um, not having a range of patrollers out there working all the time, this, this probably should not have gotten to this level of impact um, had we had the, the patrols out there. I think we, we need to be monitoring these areas. This was the result of Dan Wolfer's natural resources group out there doing some restoration work where we really came upon this. So the idea of taking a, a certain group of kids um, that were out there at that time and, and did take credit for doing some of the work, I think there's significant work here that um, was done by multiple kids over many, many years as I talked to people in that area too, that they had kids that were out in that area as well. So. Uh, if we want to pursue that line of restorative justice, it really would be having to take those individual kids at that point in time, issuing them a summons or a ticket, and then using restorative justice as an alternative to do that. So I think we've kind of passed gonna, that I'm point. Gonna, and, and they, yeah, David, I'm going to, I'm going to, um, I'm going to actually, I mean, just, just say, so just to be clear, city council, I mean, yeah, just uh, somebody else wants to debate it. I don't think we should, but. There, there's, we don't, there was a lot of talk about restorative justice, punishment, right. fines, fees. City Council has zero input on 
the enforcement of our laws. That that should be up to code enforcement and the police. So appreciate that. So let's don't yeah. even talk about that. Great. I just want to make sure that we knew that we did something that again, I think the same place that city staff in this position was now in the, the spot to really um, pursue restorative justice with those those individuals as well. So um, we'll go to the next slide at that point. Again, I think this is just, as you can tell, um, lots of use over time. Next slide. Next slide. Again, that continued impact. Uh, again, I, I just trying to reinforce the idea that this was um, long-term use by probably lots of different individuals. Next slide. So I, I think one of the things I can maybe help um, council, as they look at these different options, we heard the, the public that wrote in and also recommended option two. The real reason the staff recommended option one, and it should be a piece that I could have made clearer, when we said we're using $9,000 to um, leave the BMX area in place, it was still to use fencing and signage to close it down. So there wasn't really a rewarding of individuals for doing that. It really was saying that we recognize there's a bigger cost here. Um, and we can work that into our work schedule and our budget. We would need $9,000 to go ahead, enforce, reinforce, rebuild, and, and put some additional fencing and reinforce our signage to close that area down. We'd also bring in the community rangers this summer and have them out helping control that area. Again, with their always, our ultimate goal is to get voluntary compliance, is using education, enforcement, people being out there to try to remind people. So option one and option two really are the same. Other than the time, because staff was really looking at not um, asking council to give additional funds at this point to speed the process up. We could speed that process up if we had those additional funds and it would be something that we would be willing to do. I also heard from the, the community um, about volunteer work and we have worked with um, Wildland Restoration. They've been a great partner over the years, especially in riparian areas. They have moved from, Long, from Boulder to Longmont, so they're not right here in our community. And we know that we can work with them to, to do some work there too. So I think as you look at options one and two, it really is, does council want to use their discretionary funds? Staff would then could reorganize, reprioritize our, our, our projects and we could try to address this sooner. But one and two really do the same thing. We would be closing it down under number one. We would just be trying to work it into our budgeting and our, our existing CIP timeline. Next slide. And that's as simple as I can make it here. Can... Mayor Bagley. Mayor Bagley, we're looking at you. Uh, we're go with council member, can you not hear me? Yes, can you hear me? We can, can hear you hear now, me? but you, we were waving at you and you were ignoring us. Oh, well, that was because you guys were obviously not waving strong enough. All right, Council Member Peck, were you screaming or were you waving? Because when everybody came back on, my screen was still and then now you're all moving. So Council Member Peck, did you? Thank you. Um, I, I went on mute. I move option two. Second. All right, it's been moved and seconded for option two. Council Member Waters? Um, and then Council Member I, I, Like everybody else, I, I think we need to restore this area. Um, I'm just, if we're gonna go to option two, uh, we just heard David say that um, basically the effects of option one and two are the same. And I'm puzzling uh, David or Harold, we delayed dealing with this for, for a number of reasons that we all understand. I guess I'm a little puzzled why we didn't make some provision as we were building a budget. We're in the first meeting of a new year and now we're talking about spending $35,000 for which we didn't budget. And I understand we would take it out of a contingency fund on you know $35,000 on day one or meeting one of a new year, as opposed to 9,000. Uh, is there a reason why we didn't budget for this, knowing that we were gonna deal with this early in the year? I think the reason we wanted, we, we, we came with the option one and two is really that we feel we would have the budget at $9,000 really would be staff using our internal budgets to manage this, to get it on a faster track though, is where we really wanted to say it. And, and council's um, priorities, whereas this fall, 
it may not fall as quickly as council would like to see it or some of the other members of our community would like to see it happen if we work it into our budget and into our timeline by coming back to council to give you an update to say here's where we're at and if you hear from the public we know it's a priority still but it may not be our top priority if council would like to give some additional funds we will then make sure that we are meeting those priority timelines all right i i it'll be interesting to see what kind of demands occur or needs uh, materialize for which we would spend contingency funds as the year unfolds um, and that's, uh, uh, it just seems it seems a little out of sequence because this isn't a surprise about it, what's, what it's going to cost. We knew that before we finished building a budget. So uh, I'm going to jump in here again. Uh, Hold on, guys. Okay, so just so you know, you have the, you have the floor, Casper Pick. After this, we're going to go Harold, then then Marsha, then okay. Polly. Okay, and Polly, then you're going to be first the next couple times because I realize that. But okay, let's let's do that. So David, I understand the. Uh, the need to go to act swiftly on rebuilding this riparian area. So my question is, if we use contingency funds uh, in the next budgeting process, is there a chance for us to uh, get those funds back so that we can use them for other important uh, issues that are gonna be coming along? And that, and that would be an amendment to my motion actually. I would have no problem looking at our budget and see how that, that fits in. Again, I think that's what we were really trying to do is say we, we could probably find these dollars over time within our budget. So if we had a upfronted budget, we could use those same dollars that I would be finding later to return dollars to the council budget. I'm, I'm going to say that probably looking unable to look at Harold or Jim, if I can do that. But I'm sure there's a process in place where we could actually take dollars that we would have used it in a further out time frame to, to make this happen <laughs> and make it happen sooner. But I need Dale to jump in. interrupt just real quick, guys? Um, um, yep. I, I'm sorry, and I see Council Member Martin. You, you've got your hand up. D don't fire me. But um, um, I wanted to respond to Council Member Waters. Um, this issue did come up in your budget process. We did bring it up at, at towards the end of the budget process. And I don't know if you recall, but Jim uh, Golden did set aside additional funding as opposed to allocating it at the time in your contingency funds mm -hmm. for you to be able to respond to this issue. And so we knew it, you're correct. We knew it going into the budget. Uh, our budgets are get prepared back in May though. But by the time we got into the September, October, we knew the cost, we knew where we were. And uh, Jim mentioned that to y'all and I think, and I think Jim's still on the line, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but that um, we, we did try to make some provision um, to set some, uh, additional funding aside in your contingency um, to address this particular issue, if you so chose to do that. Thanks, Dale, for the, for the quick refresh. Council Member Martin. Thank you, Mayor Bagley. Um, I will not vote for option two if the funds have to come out of the council contingency fund. Um, I have been speaking uh, to Mr. Dominguez and Mr. Bell both about other priorities for restoring the depredations on our park system um, that I think are in fact a higher priority than the restoration of this area. Um, and so I would like to see the area closed off and protected, um, which is what the staff recommendation is. Um, and then consider separately uh, what our priorities are. Um, the reason for this is that be, is because I have been hearing from uh, constituents who are saying that we've got uh, conflicts between our homeless population's use of our parks when we don't have restroom facilities are in them, and they that because those aren't there during the winter time, 
Um, there is, the, the parks are rendered uninhabitable, um, you know, things like that. I think that's a higher priority. I do. And so I would rather see um, those things that cause uh, health issues and, and conflict in the neighborhoods be addressed first, you know, this uh, basic human decency issues, and we can work in the riparian restoration over the course of the warm months and come up with funding however we see fit. But I don't see any reason to go against the staff recommendation and rush to re restoring this particular little piece uh, of the riparian area with the understanding that yes, it's going to get restored. And uh, having been burned throughout this discussion with complex motions, um, I don't want to do it now, but um, I have a proposal that I could talk to the staff about um, and maybe get on a future agenda uh, about uh, controlling the time and, get, and getting volunteer workers uh, to work on the re this, this piece of restoration. Uh, and, and maybe the amount of volunteers that come from the community could um, be a measure of how much we really want to accelerate this, um, which also introduces a, a, an aspect of restorative justice into the matter without actually going through the legal system to do it because we could never identify all the perpetrators, but we, we would like to be able to let the guilty come forward and bend their backs a little bit to do this work. So for now, I'm just saying uh, I would prefer item number one and I won't vote, vote for uh, option number two myself. We have a motion on the table. Number two is on the table, correct? You made that motion, Joan, wasn't it? So I said council member uh, Christensen, then we're going to go with Mayor Pro Tem. Um, so in the last few days, we've gotten uh, many letters from pe people who I have a great deal of respect for, Ruby Bowman, Paula Fitzgerald, who is the queen of parks, <laughs> J.D. Sherry Malloy, J.D. Gleitz, Paige Lewis, Anna Rivas, uh, Nadine Lester, Susan Summers, Hazel Gordon, Kathy Clark, Karen Dyke, Kathy Partridge, wow. Jenny Clark. Whoops. Anyway, all of them are advocating that we do that we um, do number two. And um, I thought about that for a long time. I really originally thought that number one would be sufficient for now, but it doesn't really. You know, things will start growing in March. It's now January. And if we're going to restore this, we'll have to wait another whole year. If we make this, um, if we uh, find the funds to do it this spring, then we will have more, um, it's just the right time in terms of what grows and in terms of uh, flooding and in terms of spring runoff. Uh, I just think we should actually fix this but I I would caution people to not uh, think in terms of <laughs> these young people as being somehow terrible or anything we were all young we all did dumb things but there are now twice as many people in Longmont as when I moved here 30 years ago there is very little free land and so I don't blame them for what they did. I understand wanting to have fun on your bicycle. It's like other things you can do, but they there needs to be some education component here to uh, the idea that just because something is open, it appears open, it appears abandoned. It isn't. It's somebody else's property. Somebody else has to pay for liability insurance. Somebody else to pay for maintenance. You can't just build on a piece of land and their parents should have told them that. And, you know, it's just, it's too bad because it's a, a great idea. I admire their, their hard work. I admire the fact that they got 2000 people to sign a petition. 
So let's see if they'll get 2,000 people to come help restore, okay? Which is what Marcia suggested. And we could make this a really good positive thing for our community. Although technically it's called adverse possession. You can technically steal the land if these kids actually have been doing it long enough, although I think Colorado would change the law, but anyway, we won't get into that. Mayor Pro Tem? Thank you, Mayor Bagley. Um, so I'm just gonna start out with the fact that I support option one, because to me, foremost, we need to protect from further degradation. Uh, that That's a one on my list of, of things. The other thing is, I don't think has really been spoken about too much is that I always felt that as a council with the way we use contingency funds, there seems to be to me in a way a precedent, uh, either with helping people, helping nonprofits or helping businesses, generally speaking, versus what to me appears to be something that, while also has not necessarily been outlined for us, the difference in timelines between uh, the expedited use of contingency funds and how long that process would take versus the $9,000 protecting of it, regardless of option one, option two, and option two being, or I mean, and option one being the gradual restoration of it through normal budgeting process uh, or reallocation process that Director Bell was, was somewhat speaking of in relation to the staff recommendation. So I haven't heard yet the difference in timeline, um, but I think that based on the fact that it's only January 5th, uh, we have a lot of unknowns facing our community, not knowing exactly what the rest of the economy is gonna look like throughout the rest of the year, uh, not knowing exactly what the pandemic is gonna look like as throughout the vaccination rollout, which as we just heard, looks like actually late summer, early fall at this point before a good amount of people are vaccinated. Um, and so I'd really prefer to keep the contingency fund as much in, in place as possible to continue uh, ideally helping with housing assistance if needed or, or small business assistance if needed. Uh, because all things considered, the contingency fund's not that big, and uh, a $30,000 hit to the contingency fund is rather significant to that fund specifically. That's why I preferred option one, because it's still the promise that the city is going to restore the Greenway. It's just maybe not as expedient as some folks would like. And again, I'm only okay with it because it's already been expressed that we are going to attempt or make all attempts to protect from further degradation of the Greenway. And just an anecdote, I did grow up in this specific area of town. And as a young boy, we had a bike, an illegal bike course on city land that was at one point taken out by the city to make the underpass to go into Left, left Hand Creek Park. And while there was not as many people living in Longmont at the time, it was still a big blow to me as a child, but I, I had no, no concept that that land was mine to do with as I pleased, you know. And so it just has an anecdote for those people who say, you don't have kids, you don't understand what kids are going through. Actually, the city tore down my bike course right in that exact same area 25 years ago, you know, or 23 years ago. Just as an anecdote, this is not a new thing, so... Anyway, I, I'm, I'm going to insist that you recuse yourself. <laughs> the, the conflict of interest here is apparent. I'm calling you out publicly. I'm kidding, by the way. All right, Councilmember Peck. Thank you. I'll uh, withdraw my motion, but I also think that uh, because it's extremely light and we're not making much sense as I listen to us. <laughs> <laughs> Amen. Here, here. Motion's withdrawn. Is somebody going to make a motion? So I, I do want to say something, though, and um, we do have enough money in our contingency fund. And we also, uh, I agree with Councilwoman Martin, but I, but I haven't heard any proposals as to what to do with that money um, come forward yet. So, um, Harold, can you uh, expound on what, what's going on here? <laughs> Harold? Yeah, I think so. I've been trying to. So, and 
So a couple of questions. A, as this was coming in, obviously the requests in the budget are pushed early in in the process. Right. That wasn't part of what was submitted and what I considered to the best, to my recollection, going through the budget process. It came in much later. So that's the question to Council Member Waters on this. Um, when we look at council contingency, what I wanted to let you all know is if you remember, we carried, there were two pieces to this that we talked about. There was a, and there's other components that we looked at within the budget, but this one, we carried money over from this contingency. Plus, if you remember on the CARES funding, we replenished the money that council put in for the, the mill program. So there was another 40,000 or so. 40,000 of that was from CARE. So we're carrying over next year, 102,000 into the council contingency. Right. And we've allocated another 60,000 into the council contingency for 2021. So um, you'll have about a hundred and I think 62-ish thousand on that. And Jim's working on some of the numbers on this. And then we had some other pieces that we need to look at. So I wanted to, to clarify that too. Um, in terms of the numbers, so I think so, so answered some of, of the questions. Come, so can I, can I simplify this? Let, let's just quickly, one, what do you want to do? And then two, how are we going to pay for it? So are we going to, so are we going to, somebody make a motion to leave it alone or fix it? And then the next question is, how are we going to pay for it? And lastly, when are we going to do it? So, Council Member Riedago Um, I, you know, I would like to make a motion to select to stay with um, the thirty-five thousand to fix it. However, so use council contingency funds minus the nine thousand. So, it, the nine thousand, the city, the parks budget would cover that, and then the twenty-six thousand would come from the council contingency funds. Uh, currently we're at 67,000, is that correct? Around that? But you said, you said, you know, by the year's end, we're gonna be at 162,000. So you're, you're at 67, you're at 67,000 now because that's what was budgeted. Yes. Before the new year, I got the direction from council to carry over those additional funds. And remember that has to come in through the carryover appropriation. Okay. Piece. So, so, the before I second this, the, the motion you just made was, you said 26, but you meant 36,000 from contingency to fix it immediately. Is that what you're saying? Oh, so it, it, the 35,000 was the, mon the amount they gave us. I want to subtract 9,000. So I thought it was 45, or was it 35? No, 35. 35, okay. 35. So, yeah. And, then, and when would you want to fix it? When? As soon as possible. <laughs> okay, so the motion is, to fix the riparian area, do away with the bike track as soon as possible using twenty six or twenty six thousand dollars of council mm -hmm. contingency money. I will second that because it's late and just want to get on with it. Mm -hmm. So, Council Member uh, Christensen, just one uh, clarification: we were going to send five thousand dollars to the Lord in a rabbit hole, correct? That was already yeah, that. That. That's done. That was done, right, Harold? Jim, my, were my numbers correct? What I said to council? Okay. Yes, they were correct. Okay. Because you got Thank you. Free. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Uh, Dr. Waters? Yeah, I'm in a, I, I'm, I'm where Councilman Martin is. I, I would like to see this area restored, uh, but I'm going to support the staff recommendation. They know what they're doing. Not that I'm going to do that in every case, but it's not like they didn't think about this. And, um, and, and we've got, we do have a lot of unknowns going into the year. So I'm going to be happy to see the area restored, but I am not going to vote for option two. Obviously, if there are four votes, that's the path that's we're going to take. Uh, David Bell? Just real quick, Mayor, um, I'd like to respond to Councilmember Christensen and um, Mayor Pro Tem. Those, those letters, I read those two and from people I definitely respect as well. Um, as we start looking at planting seasons, fall is definitely a good planting season for grasses and stuff along those rest of so we, wetland areas. So we do have another window as we start looking at how we can look at kind of spacing that budget out. Um, so that goes, goes back to um, Mayor Pro Tem's question about what is that next timeline. So I would say we'd definitely try to be shooting for a fall, maybe 
restoration, planting and seeding. If we missed that window, it would be the spring the following year. So I would see this being done with, within a year, either way with that commitment to the area and that expedited means of getting it closed down so we do protect it in the interim. So what you're saying is if we vote on this motion, you'd close it off, not let anybody use it, and then reseed it and fix it next fall. That's we can work that yet. Yeah. Okay. So we've got a motion that would basically take $26,000 out of council constituency to fix the riparian area as soon as possible. And we're hearing that it's just what Mr. Bell said. And, uh, and uh, yeah, that's a motion. It's been seconded. All in favor, say aye. Aye. Opposed? Aye. Okay, opposed, say nay. 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 All right. Uh, wait, so I voted nay. Who votes voted? Did we have four votes? Interesting. All right. Four so votes for what? Against the motion. The motion was to apply. I voted against the motion. That's what I mean. So we so the motion fails. With, I move option uh, one. Okay, hold on, hold on one second. Okay. The, the, the motion fails with myself, Councilmember Martin, Dr. Waters, and Mayor Pro Tem Rodriguez against. Um, well, option one. Specifically, Dr. Waters, will you, instead of just saying option one, will you repeat, clarify the motion? It's late. I move, we leave the disturbed rare, a repairing air corridor as is, keep the area from suffering additional damage. There would need to be a fence repair, additional fencing, new signage, would cost approximately $9,000. Increased city ranger patrols and the eventual restoration of the disturbed riparian corridor would be absorbed by the parks and open space budgets. That's my motion. Okay, Second. it's been moved and seconded for option one. Um, would, that would also entail that no one would, would be allowed to use that bike, bike park. Or that Correct, bike, it's sure gonna be fenced off, posted and patrolled. All right, and, and Mr. Bell, before we vote, is it possible to come up with money and get this done in the fall anyway? Harold saying yes. Yeah, so, yeah. yeah. So, 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 yeah. so it looks like we're gonna get the same result. So all in favor say aye. 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 Oh, opposed say nay. All right. The, the, the motion carries unanimously, and it looks like we're going to rope it off. We're not going to spend council contingency, and it's going to come out of the budget. And it looks like Harold's going to try to make us all happy by fall. All right. Thanks, guys. My all challenge right. is I'm going to challenge. I'm going to challenge him to do it a little bit quicker. Oh, and that's my yeah. yeah. <laughs> I, I, I'm just, I, I just think it's funny because it's, it's, tonight's been interesting. I guess we're out of practice for a couple of weeks. <laughs> All right. The, uh, let's move on to uh, final call public and buy to be heard. Let's take two minutes and see if anyone's still awake watching us. We'll be back in two.
All right, is there anybody in the queue? No, Mayor, we have no callers at this point. I didn't think we'd have any. All right, let's go, let's go ahead and move on to Mayor and Council comments. Anybody want to say anything so pressing that's willing to keep us up past 1130? Council Member Christensen. No pressure. First, uh, I just want to say I was very happy that we um, had a proclamation for Nino Gallo. Gallo. Um, he was a very strong and kind man who was a mentor to many, many young people. And uh, he will be very sorely missed. One of the victims of COVID anyway. All right, thank you. But thank you. All right, anybody else? Councilor Rodago Ferry. So, um to the public, um, school starts tomorrow full time for elementary school. So drive slow, um, pray for us. <laughs> and, and you know, and be careful, be safe. Don't go out if you don't have to go out. I was very um, angered by the, you know, people have the right to their, their beliefs. However, you know, people are dying from this and um, you know, there was a teacher in El Paso who passed away. Her she, a video she did went viral with um, the handshakes and just really connecting with her first graders. Um, I've met her through our National Education Association, so I, I know who she is. And, um, you know, it's, it's hitting home for a lot of people. And we simple things that everybody can do to be safe and stay alive. Wear your mask, social distance, wash your hands. You know, we can have businesses open and we can function and we can have schools open if people are smart and safe and careful and not acting out of selfishness and um, irresponsibility. So that's, that's all I have to say. So good night. <laughs> all right, uh, Councilor Peck, uh, you're just not getting back. Do you want to say anything? Okay. All right, we're going to move on to city manager remarks. Anything? No okay. comments, Mayor, Council. All right, your city attorney, anything? No comments, Mayor. All right, can we have a motion to adjourn, please? I'll move that. Second. I'll second that. <laughs> we have a motion to second, and I believe it was made by Councilmember Member Peck. Um, so let's go ahead and vote. All in favor of adjourning, say aye. 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 Opposed, say nay. All right, we're adjourned unanimously. Thanks, guys. See you later. Bye. Bye.